Welcome to this week's edition of Quantum Complexity Theory. This is for the Winter 2020 offering at Paderborn University. So this week I've got no major announcements for you guys, so we can just jump right in. The topic is, go is going to be um, Quantum Classical Merlin Arthur, or just QCMA for short, and the so-called ground state connectivity problem. So to start the week's lecture off, you know, the quote this week is by Charles Darwin, you know, the very famous, uh, I suppose, biologist, you know, studied evolution, right? And Charles wrote, I have called this principle by which each slight variation, if useful, is preserved by the term of natural selection. Okay, so why am I talking about natural selection? Well, we'll see in a second, right? So in lecture five, so that was two lectures ago, I believe, we introduced, you know, the de facto definition of quantum MP, right, which was quantum Merlin Arthur QMA. And there the idea was that you know, we had a verifier which took in a quantum proof psi, right? So, you know, here's your, your verifier V and um, in came this proof psi and we output, you know, either zero or one, except the re or reject or accept, okay? And of course, the question is now, do we really need a quantum proof here, right? Because now there's flexibility, right? I mean, I've got a quantum verifier, right, at the very least. Right? If I don't have a quantum verifier, then certainly my proof is classical, right? So, um, but do we need a quantum proof, right? Because, I mean, think about it this way, right? I'm not allowed to have an arbitrary unitary V here, right? I'm only allowed to have polynomial time uniformly generated families, right? This is, relatively speaking, a very, very small set of all possible unitaries, right? So if I'm really just using a very small set of unitaries as my set of verifiers, right? Can, can it really distinguish, can such a, a, a small set of unitaries really distinguish between a general quantum state size of proof or something I could, you know, substitute that is efficiently preparable via a short quantum circuit, right? And of course, if I had a short quantum circuit for psi, then I don't need to send you psi, right? I could just send you the classical description of the gates in the circuit. And then you could use, uh, V then could use that short uh, classical proof to prepare the quantum state psi itself, right? So that's the natural question, right? And um, okay. And if we do this right, then if we have a classical proof, this is going to be the class QCMA. Okay. So the verifier is still quantum, but now we think about a classical proof, and we ask, of course, what is the power of this class, right? So what's trivial is that. If I allow a classical proof instead of a quantum proof, obviously this is only weaker because, you know, you could also send a classical proof in the case of QMA if you like. But, you know, the direction that's open is the, pre the converse direction, right? This nobody knows, right? Can you, without loss generality, always assume that a classical proof suffices, okay? And so this is really a connection to this quote at the beginning of this lecture, right? I mean, this variation of allowing a quantum proof versus a classical proof, it's not clear whether this buys you something extra, right? Whether this is useful in some sense and whether in this sense nature will opt to keep it, right? Uh, at least that's what I think I said, right? If useful, you know, each slight variation is preserved and this is called natural selection, right? So we don't know if having a quantum proof is useful here, right? So in this sense, natural selection, quote unquote, is, is yet to play its hand in the study of quantum proof systems. Okay. And so today we're going to study this quantum variant QCMA. Okay. And let's just start by defining it. So this is section one, quantum classical Merlin Arthur. Oops. Okay, and of course, whenever I say QCMA, I mean promise QCMA as usual in this course. All right, uh, let me see if I need to maybe zoom out slightly, fit a little bit more into this page. Okay, or is that maybe too much? All right, let's just leave it like this, and if I need space, I'll zoom out a bit. Okay, um, so let's just start with the definition first. Okay, so the definition at first will look very, very similar to the definition of QMA. Right, and so I'll just write it out and I'll let you kind of stare at it and see if you could spot the differences, right? So again, we're talking about promise problems. So 
So yes cases, no cases, and valid cases. And this is going to be in the class QCMA if there exists a p-uniform quantum uh, circuit family. Okay, so these are your verifiers and uh, polynomials Q and P. Okay, uh, such that, right? Um, the following holds for any input X, right? So X is just an n bit input. Qn uh, takes in n plus p of n plus q of n qubits, right? So that's what comes into the circuit, right? And uh, what you have is, so let me maybe draw a sketch again. So there's my, uh, I guess I should call this Qn, right? So I take in the input, right? This is your n bits, x, your input. Uh, then as usual, you get your um, proof, right? And um, in this case, I'll write it down formally in a second, but this is your proof. And as usual, we always get workspace, right? Otherwise, you know, we're quite restricted. So that's your Cuban. And these are just ancillas, which are initialized to all zeros. Sorry, that should look like that. And we output a single bit, right? And so um, we have these three registers, right? So um, so we have input X on register A, and we'll use this terminology, right? So this is A, right? This is going to be B, this is going to be C, right? Proof Y and 0, 1 uh, to P of N on B, and um, ancilla, so Q of N, ancilla qubits, on C, and of course these are initialized to all zeros. Okay, such that uh, measuring the output qubit of Qn in the standard basis yields the following, right? So we have three cases as usual. So um, we have the yes case or completeness, we have the no case, and then, of course, we have the invalid case. OK, so just like before, that's the basic setup. And so let me write what happens in these three cases, right? So in the S case, if your input was in the S set, right, then, just like before, there exists a proof, Y, that you could feed into uh, the circuit such that uh, Q of N accepts with probability at least two thirds. Okay. No case is again similar. Then uh, now we say for all proofs y in the space such that, uh, oops, sorry, qn accepts with probability at most one third. And in otherwise, you know, whatever, right? Anything goes, right? So the, the verifier given a proof can out output whatever it likes with any probability it likes, okay? Okay, so stare at this for a second, you know, pause the video if you like, and s see if you can spot the differences between this and QC, uh, QMA, right? Okay. So what's the difference? There's really only one difference, right? Everything is the same. The difference is this. Um, over here, you see the proof y is now a string, right? It's a string um, of length p of n, so p of n qubits, uh, but are now it's in a, initialized to a string, right? And same thing here, same thing here, right? Otherwise, everything is the same, okay? And so again, we have these uh, two thirds, uh, one thirds completeness soundness parameters. And just like before, right? We can do um, uh, 
right? Just like before, uh, number one, we can do error reduction via parallel repetition. So in this case, uh, you'd think I'd know how to spell this by now, right? Repetition, right? Okay. So in this case, um, think about what happened in QMA, right? In QMA, um, we had two notions of error reduction, right? Uh, one which was we did parallel repetition and that blew up the proof size. That was weak error reduction. And then we had strong error reduction, which somehow managed to take in just one copy of the quantum proof and still, um, you know, blow up the soundness, completing the soundness parameters to exponentially close to one and zero. Okay. So in this setting, you know, there's no, um, you get strong error reduction for free, right? Because the proof is classical, right? Um, I could reuse it over and over again, unlike a quantum state. Okay. So parallel repetition suffices there. One thing that holds here, and we don't know if it holds for uh, QMA, is that actually, uh, without lots of generality, if we like, can assume perfect completeness. Okay, so this is non-trivial to show it, but it can be shown. Okay, and the same thing holds for MA classically. Okay, it also holds for QCMA. Um, but we don't know if this holds for, so in other words here, by the way, what this means is that I can put a one here, right? We don't know if this holds for QMA, right? So for QCMA, it turns out there's a way to make it to, to modify the verification procedure so that there exists a classical proof you can give me that in the S case, I'll accept with certainty, okay? Okay, so those are two uh, nice things to, um, to keep in mind for uh, QCMA, okay? Now, one thing that's really worth remarking here, okay, and it's a trick we'll use over and over again, which is, in principle, you know, this is a quantum verifier, right? And the proof why, you know, I really have no control over it, right? If I'm, if the register is going to be modeled as taking in qubits, right, because that's what a quantum um, verifier acts on, right? In principle, I have no way of constraining a, a priori, um, you know, that this really is a string, right? I mean, it's a quantum register. In principle, a prover could send me a quantum proof, right? I mean, how am I going to stop them? Right, so this is exercise four, right? So here's my verifier, right? And my proof here, I'm just going to draw the proof register because it's the only kind of non-trivial one, right? This is a quantum register, right? So how do I prevent a cheating prover for se from sending me a genuinely entangled quantum state side? You know, I'm, I'm supposed to only look at strings, right? Okay, and so it turns out that we can circumvent this, right? So even if you gave me um, an arbitrary proof psi, right, which is a quantum entangled state, what do I do as the prover, right? Well, the natural thing to do is I just measure it right away in the standard basis. Okay, so, uh, sorry, I should call this QN again, right? QN measures psi uh, immediately. Okay, so before it does anything else, in the standard basis, okay? So immediately we just measure it, and remember what this means is that by the collapse principle, it will take psi and it will collapse it to a mixture now over strings, okay? With some probability, I get some string, okay? So in other words, um, with all loss generality, the, the prover might as well just have sent me um, a random bit string, right? And of course, if you're gonna send me a random bit string, then you might as well send me the best bit string, right? I mean, why in the world would you give me a distribution, right? Um, give me the bit string that's accepted with the highest probability. So without loss generality, then, you know, we can assume that, you know, you can give me whatever proof you want, but as far as QN is concerned, it's gonna see a bit string, right? Now, the only kind of uh, snag, if you will, here is that a measurement is not a unitary process, uh, right? By its very definition, right? It's, it's um, projecting you down into some space and renormalizing, right? So how can we simulate it with a unitary circuit QN, right? And so this, I'll leave as an exercise. Maybe we can do it in tutorial. But the basic idea is that, you know, if you go open up, uh, you know, Nielsen and Chuang, right? Remember that you can simulate this unitarily via this principle of defer deferred measurement. Okay, so all that really meant is that, you know, very roughly, if I have the proof psi coming in, you know, instead of measuring it, right, which I can't really do in the unitary setting, 
I basically do a C naught from each of these wires from the proof side to some ancilla space, right? I mean, maybe I'll very briefly sketch it, but I'll let you think about why this works. So I just have some ancilla space I add, and then, you know, these proofs right away, what, what the verifier does right away is it, you know, takes each of them and does a C naught here, and then that's it. it. It just kind of leaves them at the end, and, you know, if you want, it measures it at the end. It doesn't really matter, right? And in doing the C naught, it couples, right, each of these proof wires, right, with these ancilla qubits, and effectively speaking, right, it ends up decohering this wire, right? So that, you know, when I'm doing a measurement on this space, which is the original space, remember, all it really sees are these wires, but, you know, so it'll trace out this space, right? But if this wire is entangled with this wire, when I trace out this wire, uh, this space, right? Then here I'll get a mixed state, right, intuitively. So again, I'll let you work through the details, but this is a nice trick to keep in mind. So we're gonna use this throughout our constructions, and it's also important to make sure that QCMA is well-defined, right? Because, I mean, what does it mean to force a classical proof on a space uh, if the register is really quantum, right? Well, this gives us a, a nice, clean, uh, robust answer for that. Okay, so that is the, the, the definition of QCMA, okay? And now I want to tell you about uh, the ground state connectivity problem. Okay, or for short, we'll call this GSCon. Okay, so what's the issue here, right? The issue here is that, you know, if I have a, a quantum verifier, right, and it's accepting a, a classical proof, right, it's not clear, you know, what such a proof could be good for, right? I mean, now what is a quantum circuit going to do with a classical string, right? That's kind of odd, right? And so that's why, um, you know, this this problem of ground state connectivity is, will be interesting because it'll give us a notion of, you know, what are the types of classical proofs which might actually be useful to a quantum verifier, okay? Okay, now, um, the problem we'll study will arise in the setting of, you know, ground spaces of local Hamiltonians. Okay, so this is not unlike h equals sum over i of hi, right? So this is just going to be like the cook clevin theorem from uh, the previous lecture, right? Except now, instead of looking at the ground state energy, right, which was that smallest eigenvalue, we're going to be interested in the structure of the ground space itself, okay? And in many ways, right, you know, the estimating the ground state energy of a, of a local Hamiltonian system is kind of one of the textbook problems you learn about in undergraduate physics. Um, you know, says the guy who didn't take undergraduate physics. I mean, I was a computer scientist, right? But you know, this is what I'm what I've read when I go through these undergraduate uh, textbooks, right? But there are many ways in which really we care more about you know the properties of the ground space itself, like the properties of the actual states at low temperature, right? I mean, of which one example, of course, is the ground state energy, right? And so, ground state connectivity is one of these problems that's kind of deviating from this standard framework of looking at ground state energies, starting to think about uh, more general properties of the ground space itself. So to, re to motivate this, I'm going to start actually not in the quantum setting, but in the classical setting. Because there is a classical analog of ground state connectivity, which really arises in the study of so-called reconfiguration problems. And I'll give you the reconfiguration problem for satisfiability. Okay. So what is the setup, right? So here, imagine I'm saying, I give you a three sat formula, right? So it takes n bits and maps it to one bit, right? And now I could ask you for various properties of phi, right? So for example, I could ask you, you know, is phi satisfiable, right? And this we, uh, you know, well, no, by the Cook Levin theorem plus uh, Richard Karp's contribution that this is MP complete, right? Okay. Um, another thing I could ask you is, well, the first question asks, you know, is there a solution? I could ask you, you know, how many solutions, right? So count the number of solutions, and this is much harder, right? This is sharp P complete, which you know we're not going to focus on here. 
Okay, but uh, now I could also ask you, well, okay, what's the, the nicest way? Okay, maybe I should uh, try and draw this, right? Oh, I'm gonna be terrible at this, right? Um, okay. So, you know, we can draw the Boolean hypercube, right? Which basically says, um, we'll take all the, let's say three bit strings in this case, the, let's say phi acts on three qubits, right? And um, how does this hypercube work? Well, every time you flip a bit, you're going to, um, their edges between each vertex will be, uh, you know, a three bit string, right? And um, every time we go for, uh, along an edge, we flip precisely one bit in the string, right? So here I will flip, um, let's say zero, one, zero, right? And when I go along this edge, I will flip uh, one, zero, zero. And this may or may not be the standard drawing of the hypercube because I'm terrible at drawing and I'm going off memory here. Okay, so, um, oops. Okay, so this is supposed to look like a, a 3D cube, of course. So let me first draw the cube itself and then we can fill in the blanks, right? Okay, so how does this work? Um, so yeah, I started at 0, 0, 0, right? And then I flip a one, the last bit, and I get here, for example. Um, I flip the first bit, I get here. I flip the middle bit, I get here. You know, you could have labeled them any way you really liked, frankly. Um, and so for, for here, let's just say I flip 0, 1, 1, for example. Um, nope, that doesn't work. So I've got to flip, I suppose, um, 1, 0, 1 here, right? So um, 1, 0, 1 takes us here. Uh, one zero one uh, takes us here. Okay, that's good. This one should certainly be one one one. And now we have to play the same game here, right? Um, this one should be uh, zero one one now. Okay, and this one should be. Uh, da, 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 da. It's got a one in the middle for sure from here, and a one in the front. Right, I think that should be it. Okay. Okay. Good, so this is the Boolean hypercube on three bits, right? And so what is this thing, uh, what are these things saying? Like we can visualize these questions on this hypercube, right? So a red dot, a red vertex will mean a, a satisfying assignment, okay, to phi. That's what I'm gonna use in this notation, right? So the first one is asking, you know, is there a red dot on this hypercube, right? So let's say for example, you know, zero, zero, zero was a satisfying assignment, so I'll color it in red and so uh, the first question is asking, you know, if you, we can think of the phi, this, this formula phi, as basically an implicit description of this graph, right? It's, it's literally a graph, right? And when certain vertexes on this graph are essentially, either you can think of them as being marked in red, or you can think of the black vertices as just not being there, okay? Okay, so is there a marked vertex? Um, okay, that's NP complete. I could ask how many solutions are there? So maybe there are two solutions like this, for example. And then, you know, that problem is count the number of red vertices. That's going to be MP complete. But now I can ask other questions, right? So for example, this is a graph, right? And what can I ask on graphs? Well, you know, maybe we have a, a bunch of different uh, solutions, right? Maybe those are my solutions. And the question, one of the most natural questions you can ask on a graph is, well, is the graph connected, right? Or is it, you know, two separate components? Okay, so, um, you know, is uh, the set of solutions connected? Okay, and this is in this graph theoretic sense. And so really now we're asking about the structure of the solution space, right? I'm not just asking for one solution. I, I want to know the structure of the space now, right? And so really this is why we're talking, we're going to end up talking about the structure of ground spaces. And this thing basically um, can be much, much harder. It turns out it can actually be P space complete. And the reason why I say can be is it depends on how we ask the problem, right? So today, the way we're going to phrase the problem is we're going to give the MP complete variant of the problem. Um, but in principle, it can be P space complete. Okay, so in this picture, for example, we might ask, you know, is the set of solutions connected? And, you know, indeed it is, right? I mean, here, Right, if I think about the, the subgraph induced by the red vertices, right, all the edges connecting those, um, certainly it's a connected graph. It's just a, a chain in this case, a line. Okay. 
Okay, so now let me formalize mathematically what it means to be connected because you know I'm going to give you a classical definition and I'm going to write it in a quantum uh, terminology so that it'll be most easiest to jump to the quantum side. Okay, so this is the basic... Um, so by the way, this is a reconfiguration problem. Well, I haven't stated a reconfiguration problem yet. So let me give you the heads up of what it is. A reconfiguration problem is I'm going to give you two um, red dots to begin with, like this one and this one. And then I'm going to ask you, are those two connected? through um, other red dots, right? Is there a path I can follow that only visits red dots satisfying assignments that goes from the first satisfying assignment 000 to the last satisfying assignment 111 in this example, okay? So are these two vertices connected in this red subgraph? Okay, so uh, let's formalize this. So question, so what does uh, connected mean? So of course this makes complete sense if I think about it graph theoretically, but I want to write it in terms of my formula phi, right? So here's your answer. So your input to this reconfiguration problem is going to be, first you get this Boolean formula. Okay. I also give you um, two satisfying assignments. So two red uh, vertices. And let me call these x and y. These are also n-bit strings, of course. They're just vertices on the hypercube. And I also give you a length parameter, 1 to the m. OK, and so um, intuitively, m is going to restrict the length of your path. right? So I'm telling you you're allowed to have a path of length m. Can you go from x to y with a path of length m by going only through the red vertices? Okay. So output, right, the following. Does there exist a sequence of at most m bit flips? Okay, so you're walking on the hypercube now. You're going to you know, walk, let's say, from this vertex to this vertex. And what does that mean? Well, remember the edges of the hypercube tell us that we flip a single bit at a time, right? So 0, 0, 0 for example, would go to 1, 0, 0 here, right? So, is, so each of these bit flips is one uh, edge on the hypercube, right? So is there a sequence of at most m bit flips? And now I'm going to formalize this in a quantum way, meaning that I'm going to apply Pauli x gates to my string, right? And where I apply the gate depends on which edge I'm taking, of course. So that's why I'm going to use this um, index i1 to say it's a Pauli x on you know, one of the bits, i1. You know, I'm not, I don't know what that is ahead of time. Then I apply a Pauli x gate on i2, whatever i2 is and so forth, up to um, the last one is im, right? So I'm allowed to do m bit flips. And again, these are Pauli x. So just a not gate, right? And the key point is, like we said, there are two properties we want to satisfy. The first one is that intermediate states are in the solution space. OK. So what does that mean formally? That means that uh, for all k in the natural numbers, right, and um, intermediate states xk, right? So I started x, right? x is my very first string, and I'm trying to get to y, right? Here they are. I started x. So you know, in this picture, for example, let's uh, Imagine I call this over here x, and here I call this y, for example. And I'm trying to get from x to y. So after the kth step, I'll call that xk. Right? So what, formally, what does that mean? Well, you know, it's really nice in this kept formalism because it's very easy to write this down. Right? This is what I just apply the, the not gates, right? xi1, you know, whichever bit i1 that acted on, xi2, dot, dot, dot. And then we go only up to x um, ik. Right? I only apply the first k bit flips. So here's k. Okay. Okay, so for all of these intermediate states, what was the idea? I had to only go through red vertices, right? That's what I'm trying to say. And so what what is the defining property of a red vertex? Well, the defining property is that it satisfies the formula phi, right? All the intermediate um, vertices are satisfying assignments. Okay, so that's the first thing I wanted to do. 
And um, so that makes sure I'm walking on the red edges. And so uh, the second property I wanted is, of course, I wanted to end up at y, right? And so um, the final state is the target state. OK? And so what that basically means is that if I start at x, of course, and then I start applying all of my Pauli x operators up to I xm, eventually I'll get to y. Right, that's what this is saying. Okay, so I'll let you stare at that for a second. So this is um, what we mean by the reconfiguration problem for three set. Okay, and you can play this game with you know pretty much any problem you like. Right. Um, so, for example, vertex cover or, uh, and so forth. OK, so let's just do some quick examples just to help internalize this definition, right? So here's my uh, reconfiguration problem. OK, so exercise 5, for example, takes in an explicit formula. Let's just talk about two set to make life easy. So here's my two set formula, all right? And let's suppose I start with x equals 0, 0, y equals 2, uh, 1, 1, right? So again, this is just going to be. Um, well, okay, first, well, okay, let's draw the, the hypercube. So this is the two-bit hypercube. This will be easier to draw. Okay, so there are only uh, four vertices now. And who's connected? Well, we connect, of course, everybody that can be reached through a single bit flip at each step. Okay, there we go. And now, of course, my goal is, um, you know, I'm starting at x, so here's my x. Here's why. And by definition, these have to be satisfying assignments. And we can easily check that 0, 0 and 1, 1 satisfy this. So these are certainly going to be red dots. right? And now um, you know, we can fill in this hypergraph. right? What are the other satisfying assignments? Well, a two-set clause is only one failing assignment. right? And in this case, the failing assignment is a 0 and 1. right? So 1, 0 is a satisfying assignment. And so my, my induced hypergraph right, on red vertices looks like this. OK, and so now the question is, um, is x connected to y? And you know, clearly, if you actually draw the picture, you know this is true, right? You just go like this, right? You first walk this way, and then this way. OK, so, so that's a very kind of a basic example to give you a, a visualization of how this works. OK, and you can come up, of course, with uh, more general Boolean formulas where you know the the graph this um, the red subgraph that's induced here is not connected okay of course that that holds I mean if that wasn't true then of course uh, this reconfiguration problem could not be hard for anything um, other than perhaps P right because then the answer would is well not even then because the answer would just always be yes right well okay if I'm um, restricting the length of your sequence the answer isn't necessarily always yes right but even if I allow you unbounded length sequences, it turns out that the answer can be no. OK? And so here's an important observation. So um, the, the bound, OK, so, so I should say adding this bound m is not trivial. OK, so let's uh, remind you what this bound m was, right? Remember I said you're allowed to take at most m steps, right? That was part of the input. Um, you know, by the way, here, you know, I didn't specify m. I could have said, okay, okay, good. So here, if we say m equals to two, of course, this thing is connected with two steps. If I had sent m equals to one, then the answer would have actually been no, right? So even though zero zero is connected to one, um, right, the shortest path is of length two, and if I had put m equals to one, then the answer would have been no, right? So as you can see, you know, playing with this um, parameter m can, of course, change the, the answer to the question. But you know, what I want to point out you know, before we go on right, is that having a bound on m is, in general, non-trivial. And it's really non-trivial in the sense that um, it will drastically reduce the complexity of the problem. OK, so in general, so you might need blank many steps from x to y. Okay, so if 
such a path even exists on this hypercube. The question is, well, how many steps could you need in the worst case if I allow you to take an unbounded number of steps, right? And so naively, you might think that, you know, because, you know, this is just an n-bit string, right? You might think that the number of bit flips you could ever need is, you know, n at most, right? Because the, that's the number of bits there are, right? But of course, there's a problem here, right? The problem here is that if I go back to this hypercube, right? Here's something that looks a bit more like a cube, right? There are the number of vertices on this hypercube is the number of n bit strings, it's two to the power n, right? And it could be that the path I need to get from x to y, you know, because it has to remain in this red subspace at all times, it's not able to take a direct path where I just kind of flip the bits of x1 by one until I get to y, right? It might have to take some really weird convoluted long winding path that visits like half the hypercube until it's able to connect with y, right? Because we have to stay in the solution space at all times. And so the length of this path in general could be exponential. Okay, on that order. Okay, so what this means is that, you know, in the yes case, the proof, the length of the path itself in general is not going to be polynomial size, right? So you can't just give it to me. So you don't expect the complexity of this problem to still be um, NP if we drop this length parameter M, right? So that's why I was very careful to write this length parameter M in unary in particular, because to make sure that you can take that many steps, okay? And so, And so you might ask the question, well, maybe it's always true that the solution spaces of SAT formulas are connected, but maybe the, the path you need is so long that you can't write it down, right? And the answer is no, that's not true, right? Um, because this reconfiguration uh, problem becomes P space complete. Okay, so in other words, you know, it's still non-trivial to decide if the solution space is connected or not, but the proof is just too long. The path is too long in the S case, you can't write it down. Okay, so you should always kind of keep this in mind that these reconfiguration problems, what makes them particularly hard typically is that you're you're kind of, you might need to take a very non-trivial route through the hypercube to get from you know point A to point B. Okay, good. So now that we have this definition of reconfiguration in the classical setting, and you know, I intentionally wrote it this way that you, know, you have some start state x, and you, know, you have to get to some final state y, and in the middle you're allowed to apply quantum gates, right? I wrote that for a reason, right? Because quantumly we're gonna just copy this definition in a very natural way. Okay, so but we're, because we're in the quantum setting, formally speaking, we'll need a lot more parameters, but you know, a lot of it is technicality, right? The, the main intuition is the same. So maybe I'll scale this all up. And let's talk about reconfiguration in the quantum setting. All right. Okay, so let me just go jump right into it. We'll write down the definition and then we'll absorb it, if you will. Okay, so it's gonna be a little bit of a long definition again because we have to formally define a number of parameters. But again, I'll just point you to what's important in terms of the intuition. Okay. So we'll start by fixing a polynomial. I'm gonna call it delta to be consistent with my notes. Okay. So as usual, we'll have input and output. So let's start with our input, okay? So let's just think back to 3SAT, right? In 3SAT, the input was what? Well, we started with the 3SAT formula, right? So the natural quantum analog, as we've seen in, in the last lecture for this, is a local Hamiltonian, right? So give me a K local Hamiltonian. Uh, da, 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 da. H, okay? And this will be acting on n qubits, okay? Sorry, and I should write it as usual like this, right? So it's a sum of local terms hi, and each one acts on you know k qubits at a time. The second thing I will give you is, or well, maybe I should number these. 
and I'm going to give you a bunch of threshold parameters, just like we had for um, the, the k local Hamiltonian problem, right? So you're going to have four thresholds: a to one, a to two, a to three, a to four, um, such that so um, this thing's bigger than delta. Uh, sorry, this should be a to two versus a to one. A to four versus A to three, also greater than delta. Okay, and again, just like before, we're going to get this length parameter, right, for m a natural number. Okay, and by the way, I mean if it wasn't clear, let me be clear that um, you know, but what I mean by one to the m, of course, is the string of ones uh, that's repeated m times, right? I don't mean one to the power m, of course, because that would be trivial. Okay. And the third thing I need to give you is just like for three sat, right? I need to give you start and final uh, satisfying states, right? So here, of course, the, um, the ground states of a local Hamiltonian in general might require exponentially long circuits to prepare, right? They're quantum states, right? So we have to, of course, have a restriction here. And of course, the restriction is going to be that the start and the final states should have short quantum circuits, right? Otherwise, I can't even hope to write them down. Keeping in mind, of course, that typically speaking, the inputs to our problems are always classical, right? I, you know, typically, the field does not study or has not really um, started a rigorous study of what happens if you have quantum inputs. Okay, and, you know, I think that's a nice question, but you know, that's not what we're going to focus on here. Okay. Okay. So what does that mean? That means that I need to give you uh, poly size circuits, quantum circuits. Um, u uh, phi and u psi generating starting st and uh, target states phi and psi, right? I mean, so that's just uh, this subscript here, right? And what's the, the property? Of course, these are supposed to be um, satisfying assignments, right? So what does that mean? That means that their energies are small, right? So such that phi of my Hamiltonian phi, this is going to be small. Uh, same thing for this one, right? So the start and end states are low energy, so they're satisfying assignments. And so, you know, I have to give it a parameter. Is the parameter I'm going to use is a to 1. Again, you know, you can sort of ignore the parameters for this discussion, you know, other than just remembering that they're inverse polynomial separated. These are just the promised parameters that we have to put in, right? So, so eta one uh, is the same, and that's this one over here. Okay, so that's our definition of low energy. Okay, and now we want to ask the same thing as in the classical setting, which is, you know, is there a sequence of bit flips, right? Okay, so now of course we're in the quantum setting, so bit flips has to be generalized. So is there a sequence now of quantum gates more generally beyond just the, the Pauli knob gate, right? That will map us from the start state phi to the final state uh, psi. And throughout all the intermediate steps of this evolution, we're always in the low energy space of the Hamiltonian, the solution space. Okay, so um, in, the, uh, in the S case, right? So if there exists a sequence of two qubit unitaries. Okay, and here we really, unlike the classical setting where kind of one, one bit flips are sufficient, right? In the quantum setting, if all I did was one qubit unitaries, it's not very interesting, right? I mean, I'm not generating entanglement. I'm, I'm not doing anything at all, really. Nothing quantum, at least. And so um, we really need to move to two qubit unitaries to make this interesting quantumly. Okay, so if there exists a sequence of two qubit unitaries, um, and the sequence I'll write as ui, right? Remember that uh, circular brackets um, always mean a sequence, right? As opposed to if, if one writes this, then we're talking about a set, right? So order matters here. It's a sequence, um, i equals to one, up to m, right? And we'll assume each of these is a two qubit unitary. And what are the two properties I wanted? Well, just like I said before, right? Intermediate states, so intermediate states, are uh, low energy, so they're also solutions. So in other words, 
for all i. And remember, I take m steps, right? So for any step in the sequence, basically. And now I define my intermediate state psi i, right? Uh, this will be my um, intermediate state psi i, right? It's I start with my start state uh, feet, uh, psi. Uh, did I get this backwards? Psi. Yeah, sorry, um, I switched these here. This should be psi, this should be phi. It's not a big deal, I'm just going to switch the order. That's all. Okay? Um, so I start with psi, and then I apply the gates u1 up to uh, ui, right? So here's my i. Okay, so that's the ith intermediate gate. Okay? And what's the property I want? I want that for each of these intermediate states, the energy is low. Right? And so low, remember, was uh, defined up here. It meant we want it to be smaller than this eta one. Okay? And the second thing I needed, okay, and the second thing I needed was that my final state should be, you know, ideally equal to um, what I get from my starting state and applying this full sequence. Uh, in the quantum setting, we're allowed to do things approximately, so um, we will relax things a bit, and we'll just say that you're close to the target state. So final state close um, to target state. Okay, and that just makes it a little bit better to find. You know, quantumly, any computation you do realistically is going to be noisy ultimately in the lab, so uh, in general, it's not a good idea to make things line up perfectly, right? So what does this mean? This just means that, you know, if I take um, my target state phi, that's where I want it to go to, right? And then I take my start state and I apply all the gates u1 up to the um, Right, that means that essentially the distance between these two, right, and we'll measure this in terms of, um, should be two norm, that's small, right? So how, what is small? Well, here I'm going to use another parameter, eta three. Um, you know, again, the parameters exactly don't matter as long as they have a, a one over poly separation. Okay, uh, and then we want to output yes. Okay, that's the yes case. Okay, so if there's some way for me to kind of map from the start state psi to the final state phi in such a way that, you know, all the intermediate states I see along this path are low energy, then that's the yes case. And the no case is basically um, exactly what you expect now, uh, meaning at least one of these two has to be violated, right? We do not, of course, require that both are violated, just one. Okay, so essentially we want to take the, the converse of this or the, yeah, the negation of this, I should say. So in the no case, instead we say for all sequences of um, two qubit ui, either, right, so here notice, um, no, I don't require both of these. So either um, there exists now an i, some, some intermediate state where I have high energy, uh, such that um, psi i h psi i is now large, right? So here's this is there's some intermediate state where I leave that solution space. I'm walking off a red vertex, if you will, in the classical setting. And so what is the the parameter I'll put here? Here I'll put eta two, and this is just because in the eta one was low energy, eta two is high energy, and up here we assume that you know eta two minus eta one is larger than some inverse polynomial. Uh, I guess this should technically be some inverse polynomial. Yeah, okay, so this should probably be um, some inverse polynomial, right? Uh, because I'm saying this is at least delta. Okay, I should make a note to fix that in the notes. Okay, so, so that's this, um, Right, so in the in the no case, either at some point I kind of pop out of the slow energy space, right? Uh, another way of thinking about it is that you're like, well, okay, let's not uh, say it that way because I don't think it's, it's a good analogy. Um, or, of course, um, we violate the second condition, which is that we are not actually close to the target state. Right, so I can write down the exact same thing, except I'll just change the bound. And then here you're gonna be at least eta which is the only parameter I think I have left, then output no. Okay, that is the definition. Okay, 
So um, let's see, can I fit this all? Let me maybe scroll out just a little bit if it'll help. Uh, even then, okay. So let me, work over here like so, right? So this is the definition, let's just recap, right? Um, your input was what? It was a K-local Hamiltonian H, okay? Acting on N qubits. Uh, a bunch of thresholds, right? And um, some threshold parameter M, right? That tells you the length of the unitary sequence you're allowed to apply, okay? Um, and of course, I have to give you the start and the final states, which are both um, low energy states, so they both satisfy some nice energy condition. And the states, because you know, the input has to be classical. I have to give you a circuit that prepares them, right? Um, now, of course, yeah, okay, let's just leave it at that. So um, the circuits are going to be size poly n, okay? Good. And then the output is, you know, just like in the classical setting, um, except, of course, we're not walking on a hypercube anymore. You have either there's going to be a sequence of uh, local unitaries, right, that you can apply one at a time, so that at each intermediate stage you're in the low energy space and you end up at your target state phi, right? Um, or you're gonna violate one of those two conditions, okay? And kind of what's the physical motivation for this? Well, intuitively speaking, you know, this is related to notions of quantum memories. Um, you know, the physics, when you, when, the way the physicist might interpret this is that it's essentially saying, uh, it's essentially, sorry, asking the question of, is there an energy barrier in the, in the ground space, right? With respect to, of course, this formalization where the notion of traversing the ground space is uh, via these local unitaries, of course, right? So um, is it possible in general to go from, you know, to always go via local evolution from, you know, one state side to some other state phi, basically? Um, or do you always kind of hit an energy barrier at some point and have to kind of jump out of the ground space? Okay, that, that's, that's roughly the question this is asking. Okay, so that's kind of the, the physical um, motivation for this question, if you will. Okay. Um, in the context of things like quantum memories, like where you have a some sort of system that's trying to um, store the state of your quantum computer in terms of like code words, let's say, right? In general, you don't want this kind of property to hold, right? You don't want there to be kind of a low, a small sequence of unitaries that will um, kind of map you through the ground space um, from one code word to another, right? And the reason why is because um, if the if the evolution is always happening in this low energy space, right, then you're not really going to be able to, de to detect this thing, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're going to measure the Hamiltonian and you're never going to detect that you've left the low energy space because you haven't left the low energy space, right? And so, um, you know, without you knowing it in some sense, there, there could be a short evolution that kind of uh, discreetly maps the code word you really wanted into some other code word in your memory. And there's kind of, it's difficult to detect it basically, right? That's the, the very rough idea. But, you know, for the purpose of this lecture, Let's just say um, this is really the problem of detecting if the ground space is an energy barrier that kind of separates the or splits up the solution space. Okay, so in the remainder of this lecture, we will now prove QCMA completeness of the ground state connectivity problem. 2.1. QCMA completeness. of GSCOM. Okay, so so first, you know, before we uh, continue, right, I mean, the, one of the themes of this chapter was what? It was, uh, of this lecture was supposed to be that, you know, what kind of proofs could possibly be useful to a quantum verifier, right, to a, a quantum verification circuit, right? And so let's just make sure we're, you know, it's clear that, you know, the proof here, of course, is what intuitively is the sequence of unitaries, right? I mean, it's a classical string that describes the sequence, right? So intuitively, you know, in retrospect, that, that probably makes a lot of sense, right? Because, you know, you give a set of unitaries to a quantum verifier, which the quantum verifier might not know how to figure out ahead of time. But of course, given the unitaries now, the quantum verifier can certainly apply them, right? And, you know, in a nutshell, that's also going to be the containment proof in QCMA, proof in QCMA, okay? So let me write down the theorem we're going to prove here. This can be strengthened, but, you know, for our purposes, we're going to focus on this kind of most basic version. So there exists a polynomial R, okay? 
such that uh, gscon is qcma complete. And you know, well, now the parameters matter a bit, right? So the number of unitaries you're allowed to apply, the key point is, of course, it's going to be polynomial so that you can actually send it to the verifier in the S case. Uh, so m is going to be in um, order r of n. This one right here. And the locality of the Hamiltonian in this particular construction will be seven, but you know this can be brought down, but again, I, I don't want to um, talk about that here. Okay. And n is the, the number of qubits h acts on, right? h is the Hamiltonian that goes into the problem. Okay, so let me just go back briefly and maybe highlight a little bit more of the parameters here, right? The main parameters that come into this problem are what? Well, the locality of the Hamiltonian k, right? Ideally, we want something like 2, let's say, right? Um, the Hamiltonian itself, which is a local Hamiltonian, right? So you could write it, write it as a sum over i hi for constant size hi. We're acting on n qubits, okay? Uh, we have a bunch of these threshold parameters that just tell us kind of what counts as low energy, um, high energy, what counts as close or far in terms of the target state. We have the number of uh, steps m, right, the unitary steps you're allowed to apply. And then, of course, we have the, the start and the final states, which are specified by these circuits, uh, u psi and u phi, respectively. Okay, so those are all the parameters uh, we need to keep track of. So here, the main ones that really matter for our discussion are, you know, the number of uh, unitary gates is polynomial, the locality of the Hamiltonian is um, constant, which is good. Um, of course, it's less than ideal because 7 is rather large. Okay. Okay. So how do we prove this, right? So remember, completeness, of course, means two things, right? We have to show first containment in QCMA, and then we have to show QCMA hardness, right? So first, let's talk about uh, containment in QCMA. Okay, so uh, step one. Okay, now intuitively this is kind of obvious, right? Why is it kind of obvious? Well, at least um, you know the basic idea of what you should be doing is obvious, right? Which is that you know we set up the whole problem so that in the yes case there's this like sequence of unitaries that you can classically send a description of to me, right? And so obviously that's what you're going to send me, right? In the yes case. Okay, so. Um, and let me just sketch this here. I won't do this in full detail here. But uh, the whole idea is that the prover sends a sequence of unitaries, two qubit unitaries. And of course, when I say, OK, well, I'll clarify that in a second. So it sends a sequence of m unitaries. You know, m is the, the number of unitaries you're allowed to send, right? number of steps you can take. Okay. Now you have to be a little bit careful, of course, because technically speaking, these unitaries might, um, you know, have not irrational numbers um, entries in them, for example, right? So you cannot specify them exactly, right? And so, um, more accurately, you imagine that you can put down um, something like an epsilon net over the set of uh, two qubit unitaries, which you can certainly do. Right? So in other words, you take that space and you kind of discretize it into a set of like representatives, which are um, which will always get you within epsilon. Right? So this is just going to be some set of unitaries, a uh, two qubit <clears throat> and let me call this S. Um, sorry, this should go here, such that um, you know for all you, any two qubit unitary I might want to implement, there exists a V in my set S um, satisfying, you know, U minus V is small, right? So I, let's say the infinity norm is at most epsilon, for example, okay? So in other words, you know, I can discretize the space with this, uh, you know, finite site, uh, set S, okay? That's the basic idea. So, you know, in, instead of sending me an arbitrary two qubit unitary, of course, then you would just send me something from the set right, this, this net, epsilon net s. Okay, I don't want to say more than that, but you know, these are the kind of things you, you want to think about when you really want to formalize the statement. Okay. 
So what does the prover do? Right? So the prover, uh, sorry, the verifier do. The prover sends me the sequence of unitaries, right? What does the verifier do? Okay. Um, what does it do? Well, it can prepare poly many copies of all intermediate states. Right, so remember the intermediate states, let me just repeat this definition, is you start at your start state psi, and then you apply only the gates u1 up through ui. Right, that's this i parameter. Okay, so I'm the verifier, right? You told me the, 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 C, the preparation sequence u1 through um. I know how to prepare the start and the final state, right? Because you gave me, the input gives me circuits for that, right? So here I know how to prepare psi, right? I have a circuit for that as part of my input. I also know how to prepare the target state. I have a circuit for that. So what this means is that, you know, I can prepare polynomially many copies of every single intermediate state over and over again, right? Because again, the proof is classical. I can reuse it over and over again, right? Uh, of course, and I can also, um, prepare the target state phi in this way, right? Because I have a circuit for it. And now, of course, I've got these many copies of the states floating around, and I could just do the checks I need to do, right? Um, so remember, I need to check two things. I need to check that your energy is low, right, in each step. This I can do. I know what H is. I can prepare psi i myself, right? So I can just run the, the containment proof in QMA for the local Hamiltonian problem from before, right? Remember, this meant we just pick a random local term of H, and we measure its energy. Okay, so it'll run two tests, right? And you can do these kind of as many times as it likes until it gets kind of the accuracy it wants. Number one, so I can measure, or I shouldn't say measure, but I can estimate, right? For all i, uh, psi i, h psi i. Okay, so I could always estimate those and check that this is less than, uh, I think we said 801. Okay, and for this, remember, it just uses the uh, pick a random hi and uh, sum over i hi measure. Okay, I measure uh, psi i h, uh, maybe I should call it hk. Uh, I mean, I already use k as well, let's call it hj. Okay. Okay, and so this is just um, compare this with uh, containment in. Oops, okay, maybe I should just write it as the proof that the k local Hamiltonian problem is contained in QMA, right? Just use that protocol. That's all it is, okay? Good, so I can check the first condition, no problem. I just have to check the energies of each of these intermediate states. Now, how in the world do I check this condition, right? That you know, I'm, my target state is really reached, okay? And so here we're gonna use the fact that, um, you know, the two norm, remember, can be rewritten on one of, your, one of your earliest assignments, you saw that. The two norm can be rewritten in terms of the overlap of the two states, right? So remember what we wanna do is we wanna estimate this thing. Estimate, now the two norm of my start state, I apply all the gates now, and then I compare that to my target state phi. Okay, that's what I wanted to do. Okay, now, of course, this, and of course, uh, just for brevity, remember by definition, this is the state psi m, right? It's the intermediate state psi m, which is not really intermediate, it's at the end of the sequence, right? So this thing only depends on, remember, the overlap of the two states in question, right, psi m. Right, it really only depends on this quantity. So if I can estimate this overlap quantity, then I can certainly estimate the two norm. Okay. So how do I do this? So this is non-trivial, but you know it uses an old, an older trick basically that um, I think arose in the context of quantum fingerprinting. And so it's worth mentioning here because it's a really nice subroutine that gets used all the time as well. So to estimate uh, this thing we use something called the swap test. Okay, this is really one of those basic primitives that turns out to be surprisingly useful. 
Okay, and essentially what this says is that um, classically, okay, well, let me write down the swap test first. Okay, what does the swap test look like? It looks like this. So suppose I want to know the, the overlap between these two states, phi and psi m, and I want to do it via a polynomial size quantum circuit, right? What do I do? Well, I take a control wire, of course, otherwise this is not going to be fun. I do a Hadamard to turn it into a superposition, and then I do a particular controlled gate. I do a Hadamard, and then I measure in the standard base, okay? So the question is, what gate should I apply, right? What goes in here? Okay, and remember the goal is for me to understand how close or far these two states are. So think about it kind of logically, right? Suppose for a second, these are really the exact same state. Suppose for a second, I just did this. Okay, really they're the exact same state. So what gate would, you know, the action on such an input state, two copies of the same thing, what gate would act completely invariant on this? Of course, we don't want the identity, I mean, and what non-trivial gate? So the most natural thing to think about, perhaps, is the swap gate, right? If I have two copies of the same thing and I swap their order, right? Well, now it looks identical because they're the same thing, right? And what happens if these guys were really orthogonal, right? Let's say this was a zero and this was ket one. Well, if I have zero one and I swap the order, now I get a completely different state, right? I get one zero, which is orthogonal. So the swap gate, you know, intuitively feels like a very good distinguishing gate. So let me undo this. And so it turns out that indeed what we want to do is a conditional swap gate. Okay, swap just means, you know, it just swaps the two registers, right? But now it's conditional. And kind of the amazing thing if you anal analyze this gadget is that um, the probability here that you output zero on this wire is nothing other than one plus the overlap of, in our case, phi and psi m squared over two. Okay? So, I mean, it's, it's such a cute, elegant gadget it does a great job, and basically, you just keep running this experiment over and over again. I can do that, right? I can prepare as many copies of phi um, and psi m as I like, right? I have all the gates I need to do that. Um, well, as many meaning a polynomial number of copies. I repeat this experiment over and over again. Um, the expected, you know, um, you can calculate kind of the expected um, outcome of output of this thing, and then, you know, by, um, by repeating this experiment sufficiently many times independently, Right, you can have a very high precision estimate of well this quantity here. Okay. So again, you could probably just use something like the Hifting bound um, and take a an average, basically of all your runs, right, of um, ones and zeros that you see, right, and then you'll see that with um, just a polynomial number of trials, the probability that you'll be within a one over poly error of this thing will scale um, like one minus one over exponential. You'd be very high likelihood to get a good estimate of this. Okay. And that's how you test this final condition. This is how you test that the target state has really been more or less hit, okay, up to a one over poly um, error, okay? Good. Okay, um, oh yeah, so one of the reasons why um, this swap test is nice is like, what does this really mean, right? What is it doing if I compare it to the classical analog, right? Well, the classical analog of this is what? It's basically, what's the classical analog of a quantum state? Well. One might argue that the closest analog is a probability distribution over the n-bit strings, right? Because if I measure this in the standard basis, then that's exactly what I'll get, right? And so intuitively, what is this doing is it's basically saying that, imagine classically I had two devices that, you know, you could sample from them. You push a button and the two devices, you know, will output samples, right, according to two different distributions. And you want to understand how close are those two dis different distributions, right? Classically, that's very hard to do. But what the swap test says is that, um, by very hard, I mean you would need a lot of samples. Um, but what the swap test says basically is that if, if you could prepare you know, your states themselves, right? Yeah, suppose I could take my distribution and I could embed it into a quantum state and I just take the square roots of the probabilities and I could prepare that state efficiently, right? Then the swap test will essentially give me an efficient way of checking whether uh, those probability distributions are indeed close or far. Okay, so here's one thing, one place where you can get a, a quantum speed up over the classical analog. Okay, that's the intuition. So you should think of the swap test as generalizing this, this uh, problem of 
given two probability distributions, right? Um, are they close or are they far? Okay, by the way, if you have an arbitrary distribution, PI, right? And you wanna instead prepare the quantum state psi, uh, let me just write out the state, I mean, um, square root of PI, right? This is how you would do it, right? In general, you can't do this efficiently, right? It's not necessarily clear, right? It depends how you've been given this distribution, okay? So you have to be a little bit careful, right? Okay, um, where's this? Good, so that completes our sketch of containment in QCMA. Okay, so um, again, you can prepare as many copies of the intermediate states you like, and you just measure energies, or you can do the swap test to check how close you are to the target state. Good. So now that leaves us with proving QCMA hardness. So that is kind of the main obstacle we want to overcome. Okay, and so um, what does it mean to so show QMA hardness? Well, again, let's um, just take our promise problem. A yes, A no, A invalid. Okay. And let this be an arbitrary QCMA problem. Okay, and of course what we want to do is we want to embed this into an instance of ground state connectivity. So let x be an n bit input, be an input, right? And of course this is a, a QCMA problem, so that means we have a QCMA verifier. And I'm just gonna give this the name V, right? So I'm gonna assume that this is a circuit of you know two qubit gates as usual. And um, you know this is little n, the size of the input. The size of the circuit will be capital N, okay? Which is of course polynomial in little n. And uh, da, 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 da. okay. And um, what does this thing act on? Remember, it acts on three registers: a, or maybe I'll do this in red. And this was the input register. B, right, which is the proof register, and C, which is the ancillary register, right? These are the three registers the the verifier is allowed to act on. Okay, and I'm I'm stating this because we'll need these <coughs> letters later. Okay, and um, we can also assume without loss of generality. What can we assume about V? Well. Um, first, we can assume the completeness and soundness parameters are completeness 1 minus some epsilon, right? And soundness just epsilon. Um, and, you know, we just wanted so that uh, there's a 1 over poly gap here, right? So um, such that a 1 minus epsilon um, minus epsilon is at least 1 over poly. Okay, and, and little n, okay? Um, so that's just a standard assumption, right? And, oh yeah, and the other thing, of course, we're going to assume that we already talked about is that uh, the verifier V, again, it does not assume it's getting a classical proof. Instead, it takes in a quantum proof, but it measures it right away in the standard basis so that it essentially looks classical. So V immediately measures and again, I'm, I'm gonna put this in quotes because it doesn't actually measure, right? It does this principle of deferred measurement, right? It does C-naught gates. But it measures uh, a quantum proof. Um, in the standard basis. Okay, so before it does anything else. Okay, so those are the two assumptions we can make without loss of generality, right? And here, of course, remember that, um, you know, epsilon could be mean exponentially small even if we like. Okay, so what is our goal? All right, so our goal, let's do this in green. Green is always a good color for a goal, right? Okay, so the goal is to uh, construct. Uh, uh huh, no, 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 construct a GSCon instance. Okay, and so, you know, we're going to need a bunch of parameters here, technically speaking. H We've got these thresholds. We have got um, m, u, psi, and u, phi, okay? Let's 
such that, right? Um, okay, so if the input was a yes instance, right, then there exists a sequence of two qubit gates, u1, dot, 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 u, um, m, right? And again, m is this, this parameter here, right? Such that, um, The target state is approximately equal to you know, the start state times the circuit, and um, all intermediate states satisfy psi i, h psi i is small, right? So this is what we wanted to accomplish in the yes case, right? And in the no case, if x is in a no, Right, then we want to set it up so that for all such sequences of gates, um, either um, phi you know minus uh, psi m, that final state is large. I think we said this was a to four, or um, there exists an intermediate state such that this quantity here is large. A to two, okay. So we want to violate at least one of those two conditions. That, that's the basic setup. Okay. So make sure you're comfortable with that um, before we continue. Okay. So what's the construction, right? As usual, we're first going to give the construction, then we'll argue uh, completeness and soundness for it. The construction, by the way, will run kind of obviously in polynomial time, so I'm not going to stress that. So how do I take my QCMA verifier and embed it? into an instance of ground state connectivity, right? In particular, you know, a priori kind of the challenge of this is we're not just talking about kind of a static state like a ground state in a ground space, right? We're talking about kind of carving a space through um, the ground, carving a path through the ground space, right? So it's, it's somewhat more of a dynamic object, waving hands here, right? So how do you kind of argue about paths through a ground space? And so we're going to use a kind of a, a simple, just elegant trick that will do the job, right? And it works like this, right? The first time you see this, it might actually, you might think like, you know, what in the world is this? Like, why does this even do anything interesting, right? So let's just first write down the gadget and then we'll um, go through the logic as to why it actually does something interesting, okay? So what we're going to do kind of obviously is, you know, I have a verifier V to begin with, right? That's my uh, QCMA verifier up here. That's this uh, bad boy over here, right? So I take V, and what am I gonna do? I need a Hamiltonian, right? So I'm gonna plug it into the only Hamiltonian construction I know, which is the, the quantum cook levin theorem, right? This uh, feynman of Hamiltonian, right? So let HCL be um, the five local Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian, obtained uh, from V by applying um, the quantum cook levin theorems, circuit to Hamiltonian construction. Okay, so remember this uh, was this construction where you know we had various Hamiltonian terms. We had like an input term and a propagation term and an output term, um, and it was done in such a way that you know if there was a proof accepted by V, then you know this HCL would have a small eigenvalue, um, corresponding eigenvector being the history state, and otherwise in the no case, if there's no good proof, then all the eigenvalues of HCL would be large. Okay. And so now in, in the new construction, I'm going to take this, I'm going to boot, bootstrap this construction, right? I'm not going to actually care about the properties of this construction at a fine detail, right? In a white box fashion, I only care in a black box fashion, meaning I only care to know that either in the S case there is a small eigenvalue or in the no case there is no small eigenvalue. Okay, that's all I really care about. Okay. Um, so in particular, what this means is that, um, what do we know? Uh, we know that if x is in um, a yes, lambda min of hcl is small, right? There's some threshold we could write down. And otherwise, we know that 
if it's a no case, I know that the smallest eigenvalue is large, right? That's just what we get out of the construction. And here, by the way, we're really using the fact that the verifier is defined right now to take in an arbitrary proof. It can be fully quantum, right? But of course, we simulate it being classical by doing this principle of the deferred measurement, okay? So that's why, by the way, we can plug in the Cook-Levin construction because um, that construction allows arbitrary quantum proofs. That's one of the reasons why we really need to use this principle of deferred measurement trick. Okay, so this is all I know so far, right? But of course, I don't care about a static property like um, the ground state energy. Now I wanna think about a property of the ground space more, more generally, right? I wanna think about the structure of the ground space. So how can I bootstrap this property to say something more generally? So here's the idea. So the Hamilton 29 construct, right? So we construct Hamiltonian H, okay, acting on, let me first tell you the space it's going to act on, uh, two registers, right, at a high level. There'll be a, a Hamiltonian register number one, Okay, and the reason why it's going to be called the Hamiltonian register, which by the way has name H, is because this is where we're going to put this Cook Levin Hamiltonian. By the way, this is a CL, right? That's where this Hamiltonian will act. Okay? And um, right, and so this really will consist of all the registers that, that Cook Levin construction acts on, right? It acts on uh, A. B, C, D, right? So what was this? This is the input register, right, to the verifier. This is the proof register to the verifier, right? This is the ancilla register. And now when we push that all through the circuit to Hamiltonian construction, we had to add one more register, which was the clock register, right? And this was the unary clock register. Okay? And so this is n qubits. Why is it n qubits? Well, this is exercise uh, 10. Right, the reason why it's n qubits, let's just remind ourselves what capital N was, right? Capital N was, you know, we started by assuming we had an input X with a QCMA verifier V, and that had capital N gates, right? And so that's why the, the Hamiltonian itself, the Feynman type Hamiltonian, will need to go through n time steps, right? Because it, the history state will have n terms, well, technically n plus one terms in superposition. Okay, so this first register H will basically act on these four sub-registers because that's what the Hamiltonian HCL will act on. And the new register we add here is gonna be the so-called um, Go register because essentially it's going to, it's gonna be three qubits and it's going to act like a switch. So we're gonna build a switch gadget to uh, turn on or off um, HCL, essentially. Okay, so this is the idea. So I have this HCL, right? Uh, this one up here, sorry. And I have some nice properties about it. And the idea is gonna be that I'm gonna build a switch gadget that's gonna make it so that I could switch this Hamiltonian on and off. Okay, that's the basic idea. Okay, and then we'll see why this will allow us to um, convert things into a ground uh, ground space traversal question. So that's basically um, the Hamiltonian H I'm going to construct acts on these two registers. Uh, by the way, the Go register will just be uh, G, no, G for Go. So let's define the actual Hamiltonian now. H is, um, how is it defined? Right, it's going to be HCL acting on my H, little h register, right? That's this Hamiltonian register. So again, this just encodes the verifier V. That's it. And now I'm going to add something on my Go register. And what am I going to add? Well, you know, I'm going to define this in terms of a, a new definition because um, I'm going to reuse it over and over again. I don't want to have to write this out all the time. And what is P? Right? P is just a projection onto identity minus all zeros and all ones. Okay, so it's a three qubit projector. And it's null spaces, you know, the span of all strings, right, which are not all zeros or all ones. Okay, so that's what this thing is. 
Okay, another way of writing it, of course, is just diagonal matrix. Um, and sorry, um, it's null space is a set of all zeros or all ones, right? So here's all zeros, all ones, and everything else in the middle, there should be six of them. These strings are going to be um, energy one, right? Okay, that's what this thing does, right? So if you really want to be uh, in the null space of this term, you know, you have to set these three gold qubits to either all zeros or all ones. So this is the switch gadget. Now it doesn't work by itself. We also have to specify the start and the end states. Okay. Um, by the way, I do want to stress that you know in exercise eleven, you know this thing here, um, the way we've written it is it, it acts on three qubits at a time, so it's three local. But I claim that you can actually write this as a sum of two local terms. Okay, so you can actually get the locality down by one. And so, you know, I encourage you to try this as an exercise. We won't do it here. Okay, and so um, the idea here is that, by the way, um, H is now blank local. Well, what's the locality? Well, let's have a look at this, right? There are two main components, right? I have the Kataev Feynman Hamiltonian, and that's five local, right? And then I tensor it with this thing, and I just told you that you can make this thing two local. So therefore, together, five plus two, right? Let's, uh, you know, I told you that your elementary school knowledge is gonna be important here, right? Five plus two is seven, right? It's seven local, right? And that's what we claimed when we stated the, uh, the theorem that we wanted to prove hardness for seven local Hamiltonians. Okay. Good, so what were the start and the final states? So let's define those as well. Psi and phi, right? So the start state is going to be um, nothing, than, nothing other than all zeros in the first register. And let me be clear, the first register consists of how many qubits? Well, input is n qubits, proof is p of n qubits, ancilla is q of n qubits, and the clock register in unary was capital N qubits, okay? So that's all of that stuff. And the second register, the go register, this is on H, the go register is just three qubits, and it's just gonna be set to all zeros. And finally, Again, uh, I'm not going to write the whole thing out again, right? The only difference here is that here I have 111 now. Right in here I had 000. Okay? So I hope it's clear to you that you know, these states are trivial to prepare, right? I mean, um, all zero state is trivial to prepare, and certainly um, all we have to do to prepare the state is 111. So certainly we can write down poly size circuits that prepare these, you know? So, so these are trivial now, okay? So we, we satisfy those uh, preconditions for the input to GS code. Okay. Um, and now the question is, you know, um, the other parameter we need to specify was how many steps are you allowed to take through the ground space? What was that parameter little m? Right? How many unitary or how many steps on the hypercube, for example, were you allowed to take, right? So now, um, how about M? What about M, right? Okay, so for this, I'm just gonna need to define a parameter that we're gonna think of as a, a black box. W is going to be um, the size of the circuit, the unitary circuit, to, uh, uh, sorry. So the circuit itself will be W, the size of the circuit will be absolute value of W, um, size of the circuit to prepare um, the history state. This is uh, from the previous lecture, right? The history state of the Coquelin Hamiltonian given uh, classical proof Y. Okay, so let me refresh your memory what that meant, right? What was the history state? Right? Uh, recall. So the history state from last lecture, as we saw, was what? I mean, you started with the input x, right? You put down your proof. In our case, it's just a string y. You put down your ancillas, and then you had your clock register. And um, it was a sum over all the time steps, t equals 0 up to n, because they're n time steps total. And in the tth time step, right, you only applied gates u1 through ut, right? So here's t, here's t, and here's t. Okay. That was the history state. 
Okay, and so um, now the key observation here, right, is that normally preparing history states is hard, right? And meaning that, you know, you cannot do it with a polynomial size circuit, right? Because uh, mainly because, you know, x, x and zeros are of course easy to prepare, but the problem is normally the proof you put here is some arbitrary quantum state, which certainly will not have a poly size quantum circuit in general. But here we're talking about QCM8, right? The proof is a classical string, right? And so um, certainly um, you can prepare any history state where the proof is a classical string efficiently, right? Because to prepare a classical string, I mean, here, of course, the preparation doesn't have to be uniform, right? It can be in a non-uniform circuit, but certainly you don't need more than n bits to prepare the class, um, n Pauli x gates to prepare um, an arbitrary string y on n bits, right? So this I can prepare efficiently, and I can certainly write down x, and then all I have to do is, you know, put down a superposition over T, which I can do using Hadamard gates, and then conditioned on T, then I want to apply, you know, unitary gates U1 through UT, which certainly I could also do efficiently, okay? So the, the key observation here is that um, since um, the proof Y is classical, right, um, the size of the circuit W to prepare Y. Remember, I, I said we're defining W to be the size of the circuit to prepare the history state. This thing is in, uh, you know, polynomial in the number of qubits n. Okay. Okay. So that's good. Um, and so I need to define this. Um, there's a circuit of poly size that prepares the history state in this case. We're going to need that. And so how do I define M? Right. That was my whole goal was to define the number of unitaries you're allowed to apply in this definition. So now I can say uh, define M. It's going to, of course, depend on W. That's why I bothered to define that here. Um, what is M? So technically speaking, you know, I'll give you the full formal definition. It's two times uh, the size of, I think that was the size of the proof. And here's, you know, your size of W that comes into play. And we'll see why this happens later. Okay, so the exact expression is not so important other than it's some polynomial in M. Okay. And it depends on the size of the circuit to prepare the history state. We'll see why in a second. Okay, um, I'll write down the other parameters, but you know you don't need to worry too much about them. But let's just be complete. So, um, how about the thresholds? Okay, so here they are. Um, let's start with eight to one. These are the high and low energy thresholds, and surprise, surprise, you know, these will just have to do with the thresholds you get out of the Cook-Levin theorem, the quantum Cook-Levin theorem. So these were the high and the low energy thresholds. And here, normally what you'd get is this. So this was high energy, this is low energy. Okay, so normally um, out of the Cook-Levin construction, you got this alpha minus beta, um, alpha and beta parameters, right? Which were polynomially separated. It's not exactly what we're gonna get here, unfortunately. Low energy for us, we're gonna have to divide through by an additional term that will scale with the number of, um, da, 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 da. where did I get this thing from? Um, sorry, you gotta, oh sorry, eight and one over two, good, good, good. That will scale like this, 16 or n squared. So it's gonna scale with the number of verification steps in the unitary, okay? I think that's right, yeah. Okay, so um, so those are going to be the high and low energy thresholds, and then you know technically speaking, I mean you could look it up, but um, alpha and beta are just defined as in the Cook-Levin theorem. This is just uh, the probability, the soundness parameter, basically over m plus one. I feel like I've uh, reversed these things. You know what? Uh, this is a typo on the notes. Sorry. Duh, 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 duh. Where is it? Ah, this should be over m squared. This should be M, All right? Sorry. So of course, um, so first, can you spot the typo? Let's see. If you've been following these parameters, why? Er, okay, hold on. M plus one, right? So why is that wrong, right? I, I wrote that alpha, which comes from the Cook-Levin construction, depends on M, which is the number of unitaries in GS con. Why is that wrong? Well, we covered the Cook-Levin construction last week before we knew anything about GS con. So why would alpha know anything about little m? 
right? Which has nothing to do with the local Hamiltonian problem, right? So obviously, um, the mistake here is that this should depend on the size of the verification circuit, which is capital N in our notes, or in our discussion here. I have need to fix this in the course notes. And of course here, what that means is that um, this needs to scale with the parameter little m in our GSCon construction. Okay, and this is going to come out of something called the traversal lemma, which we're going to um, state and prove for our soundness analysis. Okay, so alpha was this, um, beta also just comes from uh, that construction. Let me just remind you what it was, but you know it doesn't really matter for this discussion. Okay, good, and epsilon is at least uh, some small inverse polynomial. Okay, so that's 8182, high and low energy. And uh, again, for completeness, let's talk about the other two parameters, which are close and far to the target state. So this is close, oops, close, and this is far from the target state. Okay, and these are going to be really simple, actually. It's just zero. Close means we're actually going to hit it exactly, it turns out, right, in the S case. And in the no case, um, we're away by some constant distance, a quarter, let's say. Okay, so you know there's some wiggle room here in these parameters. Okay, so that's the full construction. Okay, so let me just go over it again. Right, the full construction was um, my Hamiltonian was you know I take my verifier v right. I start with my verifier v. I need to convert that to a Hamiltonian, so I plug that into the quantum Coke-Levin theorem. I get a Hamiltonian so that if v was a yes instance, uh, HCl has a small eigenvalue. Otherwise, in the no case, it has a large eigenvalue. I bootstrap that Hamiltonian by <clears throat> putting it here and then attaching to it, coupling it with a switch register or a goal register. And here, this thing just projects onto the orthogonal complement of all zeros and all ones. Again, it's not clear at all why this is meaningful. My start state is all zeros. My target state is all zeros, except the goal qubits are flipped to all ones. And then, um, you know, we define the threshold parameters, which I'm not going to worry about too much uh, right now. Okay. Good. So, why in the world does this work? Right? Like, what does this even mean, kind of? Right? Okay. So, the reason why this works, maybe let's first sketch the intuition, right? So, where do we start? We start in the state, this one here, right? So, my start state is psi, right? This is my start state by definition of GSCon. So, it's all zeros. And now let's compare. First, we should check, sanity check. Is this a ground state of the Hamiltonian? Well, I mean, if I stare at this Hamiltonian, this this big H, right? Then, um, you know, the last three registers, the null space of this is precisely all zeros and all ones. Anything in the span of those two is in the null space, right? But you know, my goal register here is set to all zeros, so by definition, I'm in the null space of this register. I annihilate this altogether. Okay. So and. You know, if you look at it closely enough, you'll see that you know this Cook-Levin Hamiltonian is positive semi-definite. So the smallest energy you could hope to get is zero, and that's exactly what we get. So this is certainly in the ground space. Likewise for this, right? Because now the Go qubits are one on one. That's the other state in the null space of the projector P here. Okay, so that also annihilates this term. So that's good. I start in the null space at the beginning and I end at the null space. And now the question is, well, how do I go from all zeros to all ones, right? Well, this seems simple, right? I mean, all I have to do is kind of flip these bits one at a time, right? Now, ideally, of course, if I could do a three local unitary in one step, right, I could flip all three zeros to all three ones in one shot and we'd be done, right? The answer to GS column would be trivially yes. But crucially, the answer to G, um, the way I phrase GS column is that you're only allowed to apply two qubit gates. Okay, so there's a locality constraint. So what that means is that I cannot flip all the zeros to all ones in one shot, right? I first have to maybe flip the first two zeros to ones, and then I'll have to do one more step to flip the last um, bit to a one, right? And uh, you know, we'll formalize all this in the completeness analysis uh, right afterwards. And now the problem is just this, right? If I flip only the first two bits to ones and the last one is a zero, now I'm not in the null space of this P projector anymore, right? Now I'm not a string of all zeros, nor am I a string of all ones, right? So now that means I'm going to be on the support of this projector. And now I have a slight problem because as soon as I um, have some support here, that means that you know this Hamiltonian in some sense has been switched on, right? Now it's active. And now that means that if I want to have low energy against this joint term, whatever I put in this first register better be a low energy state of this Cook-Levin Hamiltonian, 
Otherwise, I'm in trouble. Otherwise, I have an intermediate state now where I've left the low energy subspace. That's the basic intuition. Now let's do the completeness analysis because that will formalize that intuition and, and help you see it a second time and really kind of internalize it. Okay. Okay, so let's do completeness. Okay, so now um, in this case, of course, we suppose that X is in AS. And this, of course, means that there exists a proof y. It's a classical proof of size p of n. And this thing is accepted by the QCMA verifier v with high probability, right? 1 minus epsilon. OK, what do we do now? Our job is to show we construct a sequence of local unitaries of 2 qubit in particular. Remember, this, this 2 is crucial, right? If we do three, we're, we break the, the construction, right? Two qubit unitaries. Now, of course, by the way, um, you can all scale up the construction, right? Two is not really crucial for any constant k you choose. You just make the go qubit register, uh, instead of k, it becomes k plus one, and then you'll still get the hardness result, okay? But for our setup right now, it's two is the crucial parameter. So we have a sequence of two qubit unitaries, i1 up to m, um, <coughs> satisfying the yes conditions of GSCon, right? That's our goal. Okay. Okay, so how does this work? So in the S case, we can assume the prover is honest because there's really no reason to cheat. There is a good proof. Whoops, prover, there's only one prover. Okay, um, here we go. So what does this do, right? Um, I'm going to remind you of the Hamiltonian here, H, right? So this thing acts on what? Well, it acts on, um, we had the Cook-Levin Hamiltonian, and this acted on four sub-registers, right? A, B, C, and D. So input, uh, proof, and scylla, and this was the clock register, right? And then we had this identity minus um, all zeros, minus all ones in the go register, right? Okay, in this g register. So let me just remind you of what that looked like. Okay, so what do we do? Well, we start with, by definition, psi was just all zeros in the ace register and all zeros in the g register. And our goal was to map this thing to all ones, right? So what do I do? So again, remember that if I let's say two of the gold qubits uh, to ones over here, then at that point, the Hamiltonian here, this HCL term will get activated. So I better have the history state ready there. And so because I know what Y is, right? Um, well, I shouldn't say I know what Y is, but the prover will send the, the unitary circuit uh, preparing Y, which can be done. It's a string, right? So what we will do is basically we will apply W, right? This is the circuit that prepares the history state. Again, I can do this because um, the prover can tell me the string y, and once I know y, I can prepare uh, the history state efficiently, right? So I apply it to register h, right, uh, to prepare the history state psi hist. Oh, um, okay, I used a slightly different notation here, and let me use that here. Um, I want to really emphasize that this is the history state um, based on y, right? So history state as we saw up here, right, it's you tell me what y is right here, right? You tell me what y is and then I can build the history state on top in polynomial time, okay? So the prover gives me y. Well, okay, I guess alternatively here it's the prover who's um, sending these unitaries, right? And when you send the unitary, the verifier can actually like do, do the sequence, right? So um, we prepare the history state, right? in the first register. And now I can start switching the go qubits, right? So I can apply, um, I can only do two qubit unitaries at the time, at a time, sorry. So I could do X on, you know, the first G register, the second G register, the third one I can't touch because that would then be a three local unitary, right? 
And what this will do is this will initiate checking. Checking of uh, the history state I have in the first register. Right, so as soon as I have a 1-1, one, one, right, okay, so now my intermediate state, by the way, is what? It's going to be, um, I'll call, just call it intermediate, right? Right now, what it looks like is that, you know, I have the history state in the first register, right? There it is. And in the second register, I have 1, 1, and 0, right? That's what I look like right after the step. And now the point is that, you know, 1, 1, 0, of course, is in the one eigenspace of this operator. Okay, it's, it's exactly in the space the projector projects on. And so now, you know, um, I'm essentially the overlap between um, psi intermediate and h is what? Psi intermediate. If you actually look at this, well, um, you know, we have a tensor product structure here, right? I have tensor 110, and this is also a tensor product. This is in the one eigenspace of this projector, so really this is nothing other than uh, psi history, whoops, history state of y of uh, hcl, history state of y, right? So this is what I meant when, when I flip those two first two bits to ones, now we initiate checking of um, the history state, okay? Okay, and this is not a problem because I'm in the S case, right? I know that I prepared a good history state in this case, and I know that this thing is small, right? I, in particular, I know it's less than alpha, right? And this was our eta one parameter, I believe. Okay. So it's not a problem, right? And now I finish flipping uh, the goal registers, which I can do now. I just do identity on G1, identity on G2, but now on the third one, I do the last Pauli X gate, and this will basically end uh, checking. Okay, and, and now I'm essentially done because my go qubit, uh, my go register now has all ones in it. And so what I want to do now is um, I need to have all zeros in the front, but that's easy. I can just uncompute the history state. Uncompute uh, the history state. So that just means we apply uh, W dagger, right, to H. Okay. And that means that... Um, This is, um, oh, I skipped the step, didn't I? I knew this sounded a bit funny. All right. Um, technically speaking, sorry, W is the circuit that works assuming you have the, the proof Y at the, so, uh, the right spot. And so really what I needed to say is, um, sorry, use, okay, so you give me the proof uh, Y, right? The, the prover gives me to verify the proof Y. And so <clears throat> use y, right, to prepare um, the state. Well, OK, sorry. Uh, da, 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 da. What's the nicest way to write this down? OK, maybe I'll just write what I have in the notes. So the whole idea is, in the first stage, is once you know the proof y from the verifier, I mean, you could ink hard code it into your history state, right? Before you build the history state on top, in the proof register, um, okay, maybe that's what I should write, right? So um, apply uh, Pauli X gates. Um, to HB, oh, this is what I meant to say, right? So this is the, the proof register of the Hamiltonian um, register, right? Good. Uh, to prepare the state y in in that b register, right? And then once I have that there, then I can apply the circuit w, which uh, builds the history state on top of the proof, okay? And so now um, I can uncompute that. That's what we're doing here. And of course, finally, what I need to do is I need to uncompute the proof y as well, okay? So again, um, uncompute y to get all zeros, in H, and then all ones now in G, and this is the target state. Okay, so that's the full sequence. Okay, so let me remind you now that the number of unitaries we are allowing ourselves to apply, right, this little m parameter, where was it, little m, right, 
It depended on the size, well, two times the size of the circuit W for preparing the history state. And now we see why, right? It's because in step two, you know, I actually had to prepare the history state. I applied W and here I also had to uncompute it at the end, right? Because at the end, um, I don't know what the history state will look like given the proof Y ahead of time, right? So, you know, uh, my final state just has all zeros in the front. Okay, so, you know, technically speaking, you know, I have exercise 15 in the notes that asks you to verify this fully. Everything I've uh, claimed to be true, right? So I recommend you do that. Okay, and by the way, there's a really nice um, exercise 16 as well, which makes you really try to understand this. There's really only one step in this, you know, I've written down six steps, right? There's only one step here, at the end of which we will not be in the null space of the Hamiltonian H, right? So which step is that? Well, it's technically this one, right? So here, first of all, in the first stage, um, I start with all zeros in the goal qubit register, and here I don't touch that register, so certainly I'm in the null space, right, of H. Likewise, here I haven't touched my goal qubit, so I'm still in the null space, right? Remember that when my goal qubits are all zero, I, I annihilate this projector. But here, right here, um, I've applied, you know, partial flipping of that goal register. So here I'm not in the null space of this thing anymore. And now it depends on if my history state is a null state of the cook levin Hamiltonian or not, right? If you have perfect completeness, the history state will be in the null space. But more generally for QMA, um, we can't assume that without loss generality as far as we know. So you might be some frustrated ground space, uh, ground state that has non-zero energy here. But it's at most alpha, right? That's what we had over here. And then here, once I flip the last goal register back to zero, well, now that now we're back in the null space on the goal register and, and same for these two, okay? So the only kind of uh, stage where we leave the null space is, is this one, potentially leave, I should say. So that's exercise 16, and I urge you to think about that some more. Okay. Okay, so now we can talk about soundness of the construction, okay? Now, so let's just be a formal, of course, now let's assume that we're in the null case, right? Uh, so that means that all uh, Y, all proofs, are rejected by uh, V with probability at least um, one minus epsilon. Okay, and it also means um, that, you know, when you push this therefore through the cook levin construction, the, um, which is what we did, right, the smallest energy is at most this beta parameter, whatever beta was, right? Okay, so of course the intuition here is what? Why do we get um, why do we get soundness, right? Or why do we expect to get soundness? Well, remember this was just um, the sum over HCl tensor um, P, right? Um, and this was just identity minus all zeros minus all ones, right? Intuitively, I mean, if I want to go from all zeros on that last register to all ones, and I'm only allowed two qubit gates, you would expect that, you know, at some point I need to have um, a large overlap. Uh, with some string here in this go register, right, that is not zeros and not all ones, right? And as soon as I do that, I'm in trouble, right? Because um, that means that we switch on the Hamiltonian H, you know, effectively speaking. And now I know that all the eigenvalues of H are large, right? I know that no matter what state I kind of had prepared in this first register H, little h, there's no way I'm going to get a low energy penalty, okay? And that's basically the bottleneck that we're going to try and uh, leverage. Okay. Now there's a slight problem, which is that, you know, in the S case, things were very um, nice and straightforward. I mean, we just um, apply Pauli X gates and, and life is good, right? But of course, we're not allowed to assume that uh, an arbitrary prover is going to behave in that way, right? They can apply whatever gates they want, right? As long as they're too local, of course. And moreover, those gates might entangle these two registers, H and G and so forth, right? So we have to be careful that, um, you know, the, the obvious logic for soundness really does hold, okay? It's not... Um, entirely obvious. And the main tool we'll use for this, which I'll first state and we'll use it, and we'll only prove it afterwards, is the so-called traversal lemma. Okay, and what does this say? This says the following, and I'm going to define these things in a second. So first, 
we're going to have a notion of two subspaces, right? So these are just think of these as um, n qubit subspaces. And so here's a, a keyword which I'll define shortly. So k orthogonal. Oh, sorry, I should probably put this again on the side. Subspaces. Okay. And what I want to do is I'm going to fix now, um, fix two states. Um, so V in S and uh, W in T, right? So this is, by the way, V and W are supposed to correspond ultimately to uh, the start and final states in GSCon, right? So keep thinking, S is start, right? T is not really finished, but it's the letter that comes after S, so it's T, right? But that's supposed to be the target um, you get to. So think about it that way. That's the setup we're going for. And now consider um, a sequence of uh, K qubit unitary. So of course, we're thinking about two qubit, but if you can write this more generally. So again, this is some sequence ui, i equals one up to um, m. And what is the, the key property of the sequence? Well, it's exactly what we see in GSCon, right? Which is that, you know, if I start at the start state v, right, and I apply the sequence up to any position, uh, by the way, I should say, um, oh, sorry, um, good. So now you apply the full gate circuit, right? And the claim is that you know this mapping will get you essentially all the way to w, right, up to some small parameter delta for a sum. Okay, this is the claim, right? So there, you can do this mapping with a sequence of unitaries. So that's just a very general claim right now, right? The claim now is that, um, just like before, let me define intermediate states as you know vi equals to. Um, you apply all the gates up to u on. So I start with my start state v, and I apply the first i gates, right? And just like before, I'm going to define p as a projector onto um, identity minus p s uh, pi s and pi t. These are projectors onto um, these are projectors. In this case, for example, projector onto t. That's what the second one is. And remember, t is up here, and here's s, right? So these are just the projectors onto those spaces. Okay, and so uh, what this is saying is, and so yeah, in our case, you know, think of this as you know zero 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 and one one one, right? That's where we're going with this ultimately. That's the way we'll use this lemma. Okay. Then what this is saying is that because the mapping is good, right? Meaning you you really get within delta, you can argue that therefore there must exist a time step i, right? Um, such that your intermediate state vi, right, there it is, it has high overlap with the projector p. And so what does high overlap mean? Well, you know, fill this in. The exact expression is not so important for our discussion. The only thing that's really kind of interesting here is the fact that the overlap will scale with the length of the sequence. Okay, and I'll talk more about why that shows up later. Okay, so what this is saying is that, um, you know, in, in our setting, right, think of S as the three zeros in the goalkeeper register, T is the subspace, which is the setting of uh, all ones on that register. And in GSCon, what do we want to do? We want to have a sequence of unitaries that takes the start state V to the final state W. Okay, so we assume that this is true here. Then this thing says that at some point in time in this evolution, you have to have high overlap with the orthogonal complement of all zeros and all ones on the Go register. Right, and high overlap just means this. So that means that you know there's some time step i at which we have high overlap with this uh, projector here, and remember that means that this effectively switches on this Hamiltonian, uh, the HCL, and that's bad news because in the no case, as soon as I switch this on, I'm guaranteed to be in high energy space at least beta times some factor. Okay, that's the intuition. That's what this traversal lemma helps us with. It, it basically says that we have to leave the space. Right. So uh, another way of um, sort of seeing this is that, you know, again, I'm a terrible drawer, but let me try my best to, to um, this is supposed to be, um, you know, a flat 2D plane. And here maybe I have V and here I have W. 
And imagine, you know, these are two vectors in space and I'm trying to map V to W, but, but using two local gates, okay? There's some restricted notion of locality and what I'm allowed to do. What this basically says is that in any evolution which kind of maps between the two, that evolution basically has to leave, temporarily leave this 2D subspace. It cannot stay in this, this flat space. It has to go into the third dimension to do it. That's what this is saying, right? So this would be like your VI, I guess, right? Which is kind of living in this kind of orthogonal space, right? So that's intuitively what this thing is saying. Now, of course, this doesn't hold for any pair of V and W, right? In order for this to hold, right, um, we had to have that these things are K orthogonal subspaces. Okay, so the, these guys have a special property, and let me tell you what that special property is now, okay? Of course, that special property should have to do with the locality of the unitaries we're applying, right? I'm applying only two qubit gates or K qubit gates. Um, so this property I'm about to write down should somehow depend on that, right? Should leverage that. So K orthogonal, first we'll define states, and then from that we'll just get a trivial extension to the definition of a subspace. Okay, so this is definition uh, 18. Okay. Okay, so what is this definition? This says that for K greater than one. Okay. Uh, where are we? V and W. Um, and again, let me just be clear, these are just n qubit states. Um, so this pair of uh, states is k orthogonal if for all unitaries, uh, for all k qubit unitaries, okay, v u w is zero. Okay, so what does that mean intuitively? That means that, in particular, of course, this means that V and W are orthogonal to start with, but it's actually a stronger notion of orthogonality. Not only are V and W orthogonal, but even if you apply a single local unitary, that's at most K local, right? Then um, these two states remain orthogonal. Okay, so it's a more robust notion of orthogonality, right? You, you can't ruin the orthogonality just by applying a local gate, a single local gate. Okay, that's what this definition says. And um, to generalize this to subspaces, right? Subspaces S and T now, which are subspaces of uh, C2 uh, tensor N, right? These things are K orthogonal if um, for all pairs of vectors, you know, so I pick any V and S, pick any W and T, right, doesn't matter which one, right, um, V and uh, W are K orthogonal. Okay, so this is the, the general definition. Okay, so the whole point is that, you know, this traversal lemma is going to hold if these states W and V are robustly orthogonal in this sense, right, meaning, you know, I'm only allowed to apply, say, two qubit gates, and it must be the case that V and W are not only orthogonal, but they are orthogonal under any single two qubit gate. Okay, of course, if you apply multiple two qubit gates, eventually you can do this mapping, right? They can't stay orthogonal. But if you just apply one two qubit gate, they remain orthogonal. Okay, so um, they're really orthogonal. Think about it that way. Okay, so, you know, this is an important time to step aside and do, um, do exercise 19. Okay, take a step back. And we want to prove, you know, that 0, 0, 0 and the 1, 1, 1, the states of our goal register in our construction, right, these are two orthogonal, right? So that means that these two states remain orthogonal under any single, under any two qubit unitary. And, well, this is kind of obvious, right? If I take 0, 0, 0, right, I apply any unitary I like on, say, 1, 2. I mean, it doesn't really matter which pair of qubits I choose, right? 1, 1, 1. What does this thing look like? Well, this is just this, right? It's just the first two qubits align here. This is qubits one and two. Uh, and then you have a tensor product. Well, technically you don't need the tensor product, of course, because they're scalars at this point. And then you have a one, and then your identity, and then a zero, right? And of course this is zero, right? So the whole thing goes to zero. Okay, so um, this is why we set the goal qubits 
to be sized precisely one bigger than the locality of the unitaries we're allowed to apply. Okay, so we are allowed to apply two qubit unitaries. The Go register is therefore three qubits. Okay, so um, so that means that you know, in our um, situation, you know, S will be the span of just zero zero zero, so it's a one-dimensional space, and T will be the span of one one one. Okay, so let's do this. Let me you know write up the proof of. Let's use the, the traversal lemma to prove soundness, and then we'll prove the traversal lemma. Okay. So, um, so here's the proof of uh, soundness, assuming uh, lemma 17. Okay, we haven't proved it yet. This traversal lemma. Okay. So what does this say? Um, so again, we know in this case that lambda min of Cook Levin Hamiltonian is large. Okay, so if I can only switch on this Hamiltonian, I'm intuitively good to go, right? And now I need to define my key orthogonal subspaces, right? Let S and T be the plus one eigenspaces. So I'm just going to write E spaces for short. These are the eigenspaces of, you know, these two projectors, right? Zero, 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 right? Because this is where I start. I start in the plus one eigenspace of this projector, right? Because I'm some state with zeros at the end. Right? And where I want to get to is the plus one eigenspace of this projector, right? I'm some state in H with all ones at the end, okay, on G. So th these are going to be my two key orthogonal subspaces, right? I'm trying to go from the span of this to the span of this, right? Okay, so um, exercise 21 asks you to prove that um, indeed psi is in S, our start state, and phi is in T, okay, which I'm not going to formally show, but you can, I certainly recommend you do it. It's not too difficult. Okay. And so what, we're, what are we going to do now? We want to apply the traversal lemma, right? So there are two conditions, right? Which is that, um, you know, the, the final state has to be close to the target state, and we have to be low energy throughout, okay? So, um, so let's think about any sequence uh, of two qubit unitaries. Pick your favorite one, doesn't matter. Right? Um, so either one of two things can happen, right? So technically speaking, these are the parameters we put in, but the point here is what? What do I need to, I want to apply the traversal lemma, right? To argue that at some point on the switch space, on the go register, you're going to have high overlap with just with this projector P, right? So what do I need? Well, I needed this assumption, right? That, um, you know, my, my target state was close to my, inter my final state, right? Through the mapping, right? If that's true, if the mapping worked, right, then at some intermediate point, so if this mapping worked, at some intermediate point, I had to leave that 2D space, right? Okay, so in our setting, of course, um, we know that, if, you know, if I set this parameter right, delta right, then I know that, you know, if that mapping doesn't work, then I'm already in a no case of GSCon, right? Because one of the ways I can fail GSCon is if, you know, my final state is not the target state, right? So in order in, in order not to immediately fail the, the the conditions for GS con, the S conditions, I need to assume that, okay, at least the mapping worked, right? Because otherwise I'm already in a no case and my proof didn't work, right? So a cheating prover already fails. So in this case, you know, either, um, either this is true, uh, and, and in this case, we already um, satisfy the no conditions. For GS con, meaning the cheating prover already lost, right? So how can the cheating prover win? Well, the only other thing they could hope to do is, well, um, this thing is going to be not big, but instead large. And now we need to use the traversal lemma to argue that some intermediate uh, stage now has high energy. Okay? Okay, so either this is true or uh, we apply now the traversal lemma with uh, delta equals a quarter right, to conclude what? Well, if we apply this lemma, what we'll see is that there exists an i um, such that, so these are my intermediate states, psi i and psi i, right? And now I have to be just a bit careful because 
Um, I didn't define my S and T, my key orthogonal subspaces, to just act on the Go register. I really defined them to act on the full space. So the projector I write down now will be slightly different than what I had before. I'll, it'll be some P prime, which I'll define in a second. But this acts on both H and G, right? And um, what the projection lemma will tell us now, or sorry, the traversal lemma, is it'll tell us that this is at least four, 1 over 4m squared. Um, and if you kind of plug that into the R parameters, it's eta 2 over beta, right? So the exact parameters don't matter too much, right? I mean, the point here is just that there'll be some intermediate time step at which, you know, your overlap with this projector P prime, which I'll define in a second, that is large. It's, it's not, it's at least inverse polynomially big, okay? So what is P prime? Let me just remind you, right? Um, or not remind you, let me define it, sorry. P prime is equal to um, identity minus, you know, the projectors onto these two, um, k orthogonal subspaces we defined, and in our original notation, all this really is, is just what we wanted, right? It's really just, this is the projector on the, the goal qubits that we initially had, right? This uh, orthogonal complement of zeros and ones, right? So that's all P prime really is, right? It's just what we wanted, but we have to put a tensor identity here, okay? So that it acts on the full space. Good. So, so I know this, right? I'll call the star. I know that there's some intermediate point at which I have high overlap with basically what I want with this uh, PG here. And now I'm ready to conclude what I want, right? I want to argue that at that time step I, you have a high energy, okay? You've left the low energy subspace. So how do I do that? Well, let's write it out. So I want to argue that this quantity, the energy at that step against my full Hamiltonian H is large, right? So what is this? Um, well, first let me just plug in the definition, right, of H. It was just HCL, tensor, the projector P on the Go space, right? Okay. Just by uh, by definition. Okay. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a little trick, right? I claim that this thing is at, at least, um, here, I'll write this in red, what comes out. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, so what I did is I, if you'll notice, I replaced um, the HCL term with beta identity. And in the process, I put a lower bound. So why is this true? So the reason why this is true is because remember that lambda min of H, it's positive, first of all, right? It's a positive operator. It's, it's Hermitian, that's really all I need. Um, and we know that this thing is at least beta, right? That's what we said, we're in the no case. And so what does this mean? This means that, um, HCL, right, minus beta times the identity, like if I subtract off beta from all the eigenvalues, I'm still positive, right? This is still positive semi-definite, okay? And, you know, if you like, uh, you could always rewrite this as HCL is greater than or equal to beta identity. Okay, this is a generalized inequality. And now, you know, you can prove that um, if I'm looking at a, a linear, um, this uh, trace inner product, basically, then I could replace you know, H with something it's lower bounded by as an operator, and then I'll get a lower bound sign here. Okay, that, that's the property I'm using. Okay, so in other words, the trace of A uh, X is greater than or equal to the trace of uh, B X if A is greater than or equal to B in the positive semi-definite ordering. Okay? I'll let you convince yourself of that fact, but it's a, it's a very nice useful fact that makes us very slick. You can just plug identity right in, right? So life becomes good. And by the way, this is exactly what we wanted now because, you know, this is what we have here, right? Um, so why did I do this? Well, number one, it kicks out the beta I wanted, this high energy bound, right? From the cook levin hamiltonian But now I'm also in a position to apply my traversal lemma, right? Because the traversal lemma told me that at time step psi i, I have a high overlap with identity tensor p, right? So let me just plug that in now. So now this is just... Um, well, first let me just write it this way for completeness, right? This is just the P prime I defined um, up here. So I'm just going to write it that way just to be very clear. But now I know from the traversal lemma that that is at most beta times um, eta 2 over beta. And that's, of course, just eta 2. And this is by star. Okay, that's this one over here. That's it. Okay. So um, that's how we prove that um, in the no case, 
right? Assuming the traversal limb holds, then there has to be an intermediate phase at which you have high um, overlap with this uh, the support of the goal space uh, projector, this P. And as soon as you have that, then you're going to have high energy against the, the Hamiltonian H. Okay, this is how you do it. So there's some very nice tricks in here that are kind of standard, of course, um, that are I strongly recommend you get comfortable with. Okay. Good. So the only thing left is well, how do we prove this traversal lemma, right? And here I'm really going to cheat, um, which I encourage you never to do, of course. Um, but it'll be good cheating, don't worry. I'm going to try and copy this traversal lemma statement so I don't have to rewrite the whole thing. Uh, okay, let's try it. So, you didn't work. Ah, I guess I have to do it with my pen, maybe. Yes, there we go. All right. So, what do we want to say? I'll try and copy the full thing here, including this definition if I can. All right, good. Work? Come on, tell me it worked. Perfect. Okay, now I will do a copy. Hopefully this will work now. Yes, sort of worked. All right, well, I'll just have to scroll sideways, but whatever, it worked. As far as I'm concerned, it worked. All right, good. So there was my traversal lemma, and I wanted to prove this, right? I wanted to prove that um, assuming I'm able to get from my start state to my final state, um, via this mapping, right? There's some intermediate state where I'm going to leave, you know, the span of these two k orthogonal states. Like that's my goal. Okay. So how do we prove this? Okay. So for this, we need something called. We need an additional tool, and this is very nice um, tool to keep in mind, and it's it's very intuitive, right? So the gentle measurement lemma basically says, if I have a quantum state and I do a measurement on it, but that measurement is extremely likely to occur. Like let's say there are two outcomes and the outcome one, let's say, um, like let's say I'm projecting onto um, ket zero or ket one. Suppose that the, the odds of me getting ket one are very, very high, right? Then intuitively, that means that my state must have been very close to one on that qubit anyway, right? And that means that when I do the measurement, my post-measurement state will not be disturbed too much from my initial state, right? It will look almost the same. And that's exactly what a gentle measurement is. It's a measurement which, you know, the measurement outcome is so likely that you're not going to disturb the state that much. But this gives us a formal way of uh, writing this down. Okay, so let, in particular, rho be a linear operator acting on dimension d. So this is a, a density operator most generally. And suppose I have a projector. So this is just going to be um, a projector. That's a measurement, a measurement operator, right? And the property this has is that if I measure my state with this projector, right, the odds of me getting that outcome, right, are very high. They're one minus epsilon. Okay. Then what this says is that if I compare my start state, here it is, right with my post-measurement state, which is what? It's, well, I take my state and I project down onto the space I, I project onto. Um, then that distance is small, right? And we'll use the trace distance, and the specific value will be will look like this. OK, so that's the specific bound you get. So this is a very, very nice lemma, and it's going to be useful here. But it's, again, one of those tools that it's, it's good to keep in mind. OK. So let me write down the proof first, OK? And again, it's slightly counterintuitive maybe the first time you see it. But once you get it, um, hopefully it will be clear. Um, but let's just write down the proof, and I'll try and give the intuition as we go as usual, OK? Proof of uh, lemma 17, OK? So always state your proof technique first if you can. Proof by contradiction, right? So let's suppose, right, to the contrary, right, uh, suppose that um, for all time steps, the claim is false, meaning um, our intermediate state VI of this mapping, right, has a small overlap with the projector P, 
right? So small in particular will mean, um, you know, whatever was in the, the claim, right? Here's what was in the claim, uh, da, 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 2m squared. And, you know, for brevity, I'm just going to call this kappa from now on, or just k if you prefer. Okay, I, I just don't want to write that over and over again, right? So, you know, here, here was the claim, right? The claim was that there is a time step at which we have i overlap. That was the value. And now I'm going to claim, assume to the contrary that this doesn't hold, right? So assume that for all time steps, you know, um, we're, you know, have a very small overlap with p, okay? Good. And now we're going to apply this um, thought experiment. by something called the quantum Zeno effect. Okay, and so the quantum Zeno effect is this very basic idea that, um, well, it's not basic uh, in the sense that it's very counterintuitive, but imagine you had a quantum system, right, that kept, you know, trying to evolve, let's say, right? But, you know, you, you were just a jerk about it and you just kept measuring the system, right? You're like, no, 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 you're not going anywhere, right? Um, so let's say, for example, you had a system that was in cat zero, right? And the system is trying to slowly apply, uh, say, a Pauli X gate, so it flips you from a zero to a one, right? But you know, at kind of infinitesimal time steps, you just keep measuring the system in the standard basis. And what happens? Well, remember that every time I measure the system, it projects me back, measuring the standard basis. It projects me back onto either zero or one, right? And so if my measurement is, is done very, very, very quickly, right, intuitively, my state won't have a, had a chance to have evolved very far from zero. It's, only, it's still gonna be very, very close to zero. So when I measure, I'm gonna push that thing back onto the standard basis. And since I'm very close to zero, I'm gonna stay at zero, right? So intuitively, the Zeno effect therefore says that kind of in the limit, uh, if you kind of keep doing continuous measurements, right? The state just won't evolve, right? Um, basically, it's how to be a jerk in a quantum world, right? And you can use this effect to various, um, for various things. Like there's something called um, Feynman's bomb, for example. Uh, I think that's how you spell his name, right? That is really neat. It's like, imagine you had a, a bomb, right? And you wanted to test whether this thing was active or not, right? By the way, something that happens all the day, uh, all the time in Europe, right? They always uncover these um, ordinances. Uh, this ordinance are bombs left from, you know, World War II, right? Happens all the time and they need to excavate this thing safely, right? And so, um, can you test this without blowing up the bomb, right? Without putting yourself at risk, right? And it turns out that like quantumly, you can actually do this, right? You can actually test if the bomb is active, where you treat the bomb as a black box. Okay, we know nothing about the bomb other than it has a, a button you can press to trigger the bomb, that's it, okay? And it turns out with in the quantum setting, you know, with, with very high probability, you can figure out whether the bomb is alive or dead without setting off the bomb. Okay, classically, I mean, it seems, at least to me, kind of obvious that you can't achieve this, right? If, assuming all you can do is just push the button or not, like. How are you going to know with probably better than 50%, right? Okay. Anyway, so the Zeno effect is neat. And we're going to use the same idea. We're going to consider an evolution, right? Well, we know what our evolution is, right? Our evolution is the unitaries, right? You're applying U1, U2, U3 to our start states to get to our final state. But we're going to be jerks, right? We're going to keep measuring after each unitary. We're going to try and uh, kind of collapse things um, back to where we started. That's how uh, this relates to the Zeno effect. Okay. And so here's the basic idea. Um, imagine that after each UI is applied, right? We um, we measure um, the state VI, right? This is the state uh, we get um, after applying U1 through UI via measurement. And maybe I'll put this in red. It's going to be um, pi and identity minus pi. Okay, and what is pi here, right? Equivalently, you can think of this as um, identity minus p and p, right? I'm gonna define, um, so of course, this basically means that um, pi is being defined here as i, I minus p, um, because that's the one I'm gonna care about. What, what are my odds of projecting onto that? So that's why I'm kind of redefining things slightly, but it's really the same thing as before, right? p is this, uh, magical projector of which I know I have low overlap, right? So, um, okay, so this is the idea. After every time I apply UI, right, I'm going to apply this measurement. And so to analyze this, let's define 
a pair of sequences. Okay, so we have two sequences. Number one, I'm going to have the sequence uh, vi prime now. And what is this? This is what? This basically is you apply the full circuit up to step i, so you give me um, everything up to step i, and now you only do the measurement for the first time in the i-th step. So you project onto p, uh, pi. And remember, this is also just i minus p, if you like. Okay? Okay, and this is for any i and m. You could define this. Okay, so that means you don't do the measurement right away. You wait until the i-th time step. And now, um, now comes the jerk version, which is um, you keep doing the measurement after every time step. Okay, so what happens if... Um, so first, let me just do it in the general case, but there's also a base case, right? So this is vi double prime. And here the idea is you take the previous state and you apply the next gate, but again, you measure. Okay, and here note that I have a double prime here. So um, this is all done recursively, this measurement, right? So um, this is gonna denote the sequence of states you get if you were to always do unitary measure, unitary measure, unitary measure, unitary measure, okay? So this is kind of like, um, we apply, you know, if we think of each of these as being a unitary u, we buy, apply a bunch of unitaries, and only here maybe uh, then I measure, right? Uh, maybe this is the i-th step, and here, um, you know, I do a unitary, and then here I just, and then I measure right away pi, each time, okay? That's the difference, and then we do a unitary, and then we measure. Of course, this picture is not accurate because when you do a measurement um, here, you're going to disturb your state. So I mean, technically, the state will move. And that's going to be important in our, in our analysis. OK, so this is um, the recursive case when i is at least 2. And the very first time, whoops, v i, uh, sorry, sorry, v1 double prime is going to be equal to, I'm going to define it as just v1 prime. Okay, and what is v1 prime? Well, it's just basically what you think, which is, uh, it's just this thing, right? You apply the first gate, it's, it's literally this picture. You apply the first unitary and then you measure right away. Oops. So that is um, the first uh, v1 double prime. Okay, so the point now is I'm gonna compare these two sequences of states we can possibly get in this thought experiment, and I wanna arrive at a contradiction, okay? Okay, so, um, and okay, let me note that vi prime and uh, vi double prime are not in general going to be normalized, right? It doesn't matter, but it's good to, to make sense of this, right? Or to, to note it, right? Because I'm doing projections and I'm not renormalizing, okay? And it doesn't matter, right? Okay, so there are two steps to this, right? The first step is what we're going to prove is that um, for all i, um, If I did the true evolution, right, minus uh, this evolution where I keep measuring via the Zeno effect, right, this thing is small. It's going to be at most two. Um, here's the i, by the way, is the ith state, two i, and kappa was that funny parameter, which, you know, doesn't matter right now, right? So the point is that, you know, um, after i steps, you know, you're if you just did the, the proper measure, evolution with no measurements versus the version where you, you keep measuring, right? Then the claim is that we're not going to be too far off, actually. So the measurements shouldn't disturb us too much. So intuitively, why should this be true, right? The reason is because we're assuming, right, at each step, for sake of contradiction, that your overlap with P is very, very small. Okay? That's what we're assuming. It's smaller than kappa. Okay? So that means that your overlap with i minus p is large, right? Those are the only two outcomes. So in other words, your overlap with pi is large, okay? So what that means is that, you know, when I apply u here, right, my overlap with pi is large, right? So that means that the gentle measurement says, gentle measurement lemma says, if I have a state that my overlap with the measurement operator pi is large, then when I measure pi, I'm not going to disturb my state too much, okay? So I measure pi here, this doesn't change that much, right? So I apply the next u and I measure pi again. Well, again, um, I know that intuitively, you know, I'm not going to be, I'm always going to have a high overlap with pi, right? Um, 
Well, okay, technically speaking, we have to use a triangle inequality here, but the point is that we can prove that by induction that <clears throat> at every step, basically, you're always kind of close to this space that pi will project on. So every measurement we make, the gentle measurement lemma will tell us that we won't disturb the state too much. And so that means that um, whether I had done the, these projections here or had just done a big unit, uh, all the unitaries without measuring, the end states will be pretty close to where uh, we should have gotten, basically. So that's the first um, claim. And now let's prove this, okay? So base case, i equals to 1. So what do I know? Well, I know that by definition, um, right, I'm trying to prove something about uh, v1 prime. I'm trying to prove something about v with no primes, v1 with no primes, and v do v1 double prime, right? So I know here that v1 double prime just equals to v1 prime. That was just the definition right here. That was the base case definition here, okay? And, um, okay, so since I know that my state v1 is at most kappa, this thing, right? This is just by assumption. That was, uh, here, let me give this a name. This is double star. That was just our assumption, right, for contradiction. So this is uh, by double star. Right, so then since this is true, right, um, then what I know is that therefore um, the trace of pi, right, which is identity minus p, right, so this is just identity minus p, let's be clear, of v1, uh, v1, uh, v1, v1, uh, is large, right, is at least 1 minus kappa, right? And so now I can apply this gentle measurement lemma, right? So exercise uh, 23 says that prove that this is true, that the gentle measurement lemma implies that therefore the distance therefore between um, v1 and um, v1 double prime is small is at least is strictly smaller than 2 square root cap. Okay? So, I mean, intuitively, this is just because, you know, I'm comparing v1 to v1 double prime, which is just v1 with a single prime, and that just meant that um, it's the same thing as v1, except you did one measurement, but the measurement was highly likely to succeed. So, you know, gentle measurement lemma will more or less immediately give us this claim. Okay, so that's the base case, and now for the inductive case, like, that's this base case right here, right? When I do this first measurement, I'll slightly per perturb my state a bit, and now I rinse and repeat, right? And the point is, of course, every time I do this, I'll pick up a small error, so the errors will add up, right? But the point is that each error is small relative to the number of steps, m, right? So that um, because of this, the errors will, that we accumulate will be sufficiently small that when we're done with these uh, many measurements, we're still going to be approximately where we should have been if we hadn't made any measurements. That's the basic idea. So here's the inductive case. So let's assume that, um, let me give my induction hypothesis a name uh, right here. So let's call this uh, star, star, star. Okay, assume that this uh, induction hypothesis holds for one is at most i, which is at least j minus one. So we prove for um, i equals to j, right? Standard induction setup that you learn in, well, at least I learned it, I think in first year university, I don't exactly remember now. Okay, so what do we have then? Right, so what I wanna do now is I wanted to say something about this thing, right? Now I'm talking about vj, right? vj minus uh, vj double prime, vj double prime, right? And remember, I want to show that this distance is small and I wanna do it using the induction hypothesis. So what am I going to do? Well, the problem is that, you know, a priori, I don't know the difference. You know, these two states are quite different looking, right? One of them, vi, right, has no measurements at all. And this one has measurements at every single time step, right? That's a bit annoying. So what I'm instead going to do is I'm instead going to um, apply the triangle inequality to break this up into and introduce an intermediary term, which will be the single prime states, which now have um, at least a few more measurements kind of thrown in between, 
right? So this is trace distance this, trace distance of vj prime minus vj double prime. Okay, trace. It's just triangle inequality. Okay, so I've added these terms, added and subtracted this term, and then done a triangle inequality. Okay, so what do I do? What do I know now? So what I know now is the following. Like, so why did I do this, right? Why is it nice to pair these two? Well, the reason is because remember that this one here does the full evolution with no measurements up to point J. And this one does the full evolution and only does a single measurement at the very end. Okay, so that means that you know I can apply my initial assumption, right? My initial assumption said that uh, remember that at each time step, you know my overlap with p is small; it's at most kappa, and so you know I only I'm only doing one measurement here at the very end here, and so I could apply the gentle measurement lemma right away to this thing. So maybe I'll move things over to give me more space. This is going to be strictly smaller than two square root kappa, and the second term I'm just going to leave alone for now. Um, Okay, um, this is just the gentle measurement. Okay, so this I then get. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, strip off the last, I, I want to use a, an induction hypothesis, right? So what does that mean? That means that now for this term, right, I need to strip off the, the very last thing that happened, right? Which is a, a unitary and possibly a measurement, right? Um, and I want to have a j minus one. So let's just do that. So I'm just, this is just a rewriting. I'm not doing anything uh, fancy here. If you strip this off, what does, what's vj prime? Well, what is that? That's just vj minus one, meaning no measurements. You just do the first j minus one unitaries. And then you apply um, the jth unitary and you do one measurement at the end, right? That's, that's what, um, by definition, that's what this was, okay? And well, what about vj double prime? Well, by definition, that was what? Well, that was um, the same thing, vj minus one double prime, vj minus one double prime, right? To get from vj minus one double prime to vj double prime, right, what did we do? Well, we just applied the next unitary and the next measurement, right? That was the definition. So I could rewrite these now in terms of j minus one, which is what I wanted, because now I'm in a position to apply the induction hypothesis, I need to, of course, conjugate things properly, okay, just by definition. Okay, and now I'm going to um, start playing some games with norms, okay? So, I mean, there are various ways you can prove this uh, lemma here, right? Um, sorry, so the two square root k is not going anywhere, right? And so now I want to argue that this is at most um, the norm of, I want to get rid of the projector and the unitary, right? Okay, I want to, I want to write this, right? So, so these terms are now gone, right? This one and this one. So why is this true? Well, um, so intuitively, this I think this is true directly from um, some multiplicativity of the norm. Uh, I think that holds for the trace distance, but you know the one we um, we use in the lecture notes. Uh, let me be slightly more precise, uh, just to make sure what I tell you is correct. Is that if you have three operators and you have their p norm, that's at most the infinity norm of the first operator times um, the p norm of the second operator times the infinity norm of the third operator. So this is just a fact. And so what this allows us to do is, you know. A and C for us will be the projectors pi, right? This is pi, this is pi in our setting. And, and so I could upper bound this quantity, sorry, this one. I could strip off pi and pi at the front at the end. Those things are projectors, their eigenvalues are zero and one. So the infinity norm is one, okay? So they just disappear, okay? And so then I just have the P norm of this thing here up to these unitaries, uj, and, but we know that the trace norm is unitarily invariant, right? So now that unitary just disappears. So we're using that and the fact that um, the p norms are unitarily invariant. Okay, so we're using these two facts. 
Okay, so that's how we get this upper bound. And now we're essentially done, right? Because now I could just plug in the induction hypothesis. I've got the same statement except now with j minus one at the end. And so that's just at most two square root kappa um, plus two uh, times j minus one square root kappa. It's just by induction hypothesis. Okay, and that's just two times j times square root k, and that's exactly what I wanted to prove. Okay. Okay, so that was, um, this was our claim, right? That for any time step i, you know, the difference between the regular um, evolution versus evolution and measurement at each step is at most two times the number of steps times kappa. And that's what we have over here. Uh, square root, oh, uh, is that right? Why is there a square root here? Oh, sorry, there's, there's supposed to be a square root up here. That's a typo. Sorry, this should be a square root here, that's why. All right, so um, the only other thing is that now I just want to, you know, I have a trace norm bound between these two, right? And so I just want to convert this to, um, okay, yeah, so then I just want to argue that, um, okay, this just says that if I follow the regular evolution versus the measurement at each step evolution, they won't be so far off. And what was my ultimate goal? Well, my ultimate goal was that this thing was supposed to get to W, right? This thing had a target in mind. So this was supposed to go to W, and well, this one's not too far off, so this one should also be close to W now, right? That's uh, the last thing to do, and I'm just gonna leave that to an exercise. Um, so use, now this thing we just proved to show that um, therefore, this kind of funny perturbed thing, right, where we measure and do a unitary evolution at each step, this thing is also going to be close to the target state. So this thing, um, and all I need is that this thing is strictly smaller than one. Okay, that's it for the contradiction. Okay, so um, that's it. Okay, so in other words, in this thought experiment, if I measure it after each step, I'm still going to be, you know, have some nice uh, distance to, to the target, right? Nice meaning smaller than one trace distance. Okay, step two is the contradiction, and you know, now we're just basically going to apply the definition of key orthogonality, right? So here's the point, right? So what we did before was this, right? We said, let's suppose we started at V and we wanted to kind of rotate down into W. Let's think about this picture again, right? And again, I'm just, these are just intuitive sketches, right? Um, and so we apply this, you know, let's say U1, right? And then we measure, right? That was kind of this funny game we played to get the states, um, vi double prime. And the whole idea is that, well, by assumption, we were saying that, uh, you know, when I do this unitary and I measure, I'm, I'm very close to that subspace anyway, so therefore the measurement won't change me too much, right? But if you think about it, this completely flies in the face of the definition of key orthogonality, right? Because what key orthogonality said was that if I have v and I have w, right, and I uh, do, and these are k orthogonal by definition, right? Then if I do a k local unitary, right, and then I project basically onto, um, you know, the span of these two vectors versus their orthogonal complement, which is the measurement of pi, then, um, you know, v and w remain orthogonal, right? So v is still going to be orthogonal to w even if I apply this k local unitary u1. Okay, that was a bit of a mouthful. I think I managed to confuse even myself, so let's um, go through that again. Right, so first let me just write out the, the term, like the formal argument, right? Okay, so since, sorry, uh, V was an S, right? And um, S and T are K orthogonal. Okay, and of course W is in T, of course. So in, in this particular case, I should say two orthogonal because that's kind of our setting, right? Okay, and remember S and T where this is where the goal register is all zeros, this is where the goal register is all ones, right? Okay. Um, we have that for all I and M, okay, so um, this is the magic point. Okay, so if we play this game where we always measure after each step, we're still in S, right? So why is this true? Well, because I'm starting here at V, right? I'm applying a single 
two qubit gate, right? And then I'm measuring onto pi. And what is pi? Let me just rewrite out what pi is. Pi is identity minus p, right? Um, and what is that? That was just going to be equal to the, the projection onto 0, 0, 0 plus 1, 1, 1, right? That's what identity minus p was. Okay, and so for us, v is, think of it as 0, 0, 0. This is uh, 1, 1, 1, right? And so what's going on is, you know, I apply a single qubit unitary. It's just two qubits. Sorry, it's a two qubit unitary. And then I push you down onto 0, 0, 0 and 1, 1, 1 versus this orthogonal complement, right? And the point here is that uh, when I do this, right, um, I know that, you know, these two states are still going to be orthogonal, right? So the only state that you can um, have overlap with at this point is this state right here, right? Um, you certainly cannot project onto this output outcome, right? Oh, yeah, okay, sorry. So, you know, I have some vector. It's in some higher dimensional space. I'm pushing you down onto this 2D space, right? And now the question is, where in this 2D space do you live, right? So I have this vector, um, this thing here. You can imagine it coming out of the paper, if you like, right? And now I'm, I'm squishing it back down onto this 2D subspace, right? So, and now there are only two components here, either 0, 0, 0 or 1, 1, 1. Okay, that's what we're projecting onto. But the problem is, the question is, what is your overlap on this? I claim the overlap is 0. Why is the overlap 0? Well, we just applied a two-local gate. And by definition of two orthogonality, if I apply a two-local two gate, this thing will still be orthogonal to W. That was the definition of key orthogonality. So if I squish you back down onto this 2D plane, right, then you cannot have any overlap with W. All your overlap is on V. You're not a unit vector, but who cares? Right? That doesn't matter. Right? So that's what this is saying. Since um, V and W are two orthogonal. Right? So that's the key observation. And that's essentially the crux of the contradiction, right? Because now we just play the same game over and over again, right? I apply U, right? I measure. I push you down onto this 2D subspace. Because you're K orthogonal, that U will you'll still be orthogonal to W, so you'll kind of reset back to V. And now we repeat. Now you apply the next unitary. It's also a two qubit gate. You're gonna move over here. I'm gonna do a projection, I'm gonna push you back onto V. And it's gonna keep doing the same thing over and over again. Right? So this means that at the very end, when I keep doing this weird evolution where I do the evolution and I measure, right? At the end, you're always orthogonal to W. I keep pushing you back. I'm a jerk, right? This is what I do, right? I always push you back to your start state. And so what does this mean? This implies that the one norm, the distance between um, Sorry, this is a V, not a W. Of this funny measured state, right, versus my true target, this is just going to equal to 1 plus the norm of V double prime. And this will be, of course, at least 1 because, well, a norm is always non negative, right? Okay, so I'll, I'll let you work out this expression. Um, but essentially, it follows from this, right? I mean, so where does this fall from intuitively? I mean, um, remember the trace norm for a pair of pure states can be written in terms of the two norm, right? And the two norm is writable in terms of the inner product between these two. And well, we know what the inner product is, it's zero, right? So apply this, and you'll see that you get one plus something that's not negative. Uh, boom, we have a contradiction, right? This. Um, this trace, inter, uh, this trace distance is at least one, but here we said that the trace distance is strictly smaller than one. Contradiction. Ha ha. Okay, now I get to draw four stars. Um, so this is a contradiction. Okay. And that's how we prove the traversal norm. Okay, so there are some really nice um, kind of standard tools that get used here, which is this um, this gentle measurement lemma, for example, which is always worth remembering, right? So the, remember the crux of the argument was that you know you can play this thought experiment with the Zeno effect, where you imagine you either evolve all the way, or you kind of evolve and measure, evolve and measure, evolve and measure. And there are two pictures to this, right? One of them says that if you're assuming you're always going to be very close. Okay, so by the way, let me um, be very clear. Why does the first step work? Right? The first step, we, we use the gentle measurement lemma. And why did that work? Well, the reason is because 
the claim for the contradiction says that um, in theory, right, um, I'm saying that in each step of the evolution, you're very close to this 2D subspace, right? You don't really leave that page too much. You're not deviating too much. So if I'm going to project you back onto that space, it's going to be a very gentle measurement. You haven't really left that page. So when I push you down, the state you get will look very similar. That's why the first part we were able to argue that, you know, we can track this vector as it keeps going. And now in the second uh, phase, we're using the fact that, well, these two guys are key orthogonal. And so if we keep measuring after every single unitary, well, this is always going to reset the state. You're always going to switch back to V. And so really, you can get nowhere near W. Okay. So the assumption we started with, that throughout this evolution, remember, the whole goal of this was to argue that this evolution via two qubit unitaries from V to W, remember the goal was, let me show you the picture, right? The goal was, uh, where's my picture? There. The goal was when I go from V to W, right, I have to leave that, that flat piece of paper, right? I have to go into the third dimension with non-negligible overlap, right? And so that's precisely what this is saying, right? We use, if you assume to the contrary that you stay in the, close to that paper throughout, the gentle measurement lemma says that the, the evolution will work. But K orthogonally says that, you know, we'll always kind of reset. And so really, then you will never get from V to W, right, with this thought experiment. And so um, you get your contradiction. That's the proof of the, uh, the, of, the, of the traversal lemma. And finally, let me say just a little bit about the uh, tightness of the traversal lemma. Okay. So you might wonder that when you st stare at this lemma, right? Do, 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 where is it? Yeah. Um, at this lemma, we said that there exists some point, intermediate point, at which you leave this paper and your overlap with this orthogonal space scales like one over the number of <coughs> time steps um, UI you're applying. So do you really need this one over M? It seems kind of odd, right? The answer is yes. And you know when you see the answer, like when I give you the sketch for the intuition as to why it's yes, then you know I think at least it makes good sense, right? So here's you know a theorem you can state. We will not prove it, but I'll very briefly sketch the intuition, which will be wholly inaccurate, but it will give you the idea. So <clears throat> fix any, we're obviously using the notation of the traversal lemma. So fix any delta between um, zero and a half and consider, uh, sorry, it should be two orthogonal, right? Two orthogonal states, the ones from our construction, right? In our case, we'll see why this holds, right? Sorry, this is W, okay and define p equals to just like we did this thing okay then there exists uh, a sequence of uis right from i equals to 1 up to m okay and these are um, uh, two local gates of course such that for all i um, vi of p of vi is uh, smaller than or equal to delta if m uh, is in order 1 over delta squared. Um, and of course, um, ui uh, maps uh, v to w perfectly in this case. OK, so what's the point here? The point here is the following, right? Suppose you want to play this game where at any point in time, right, your you know, delta kind of close to that 2D sheet of paper. You don't deviate from it too much, right? You can pick delta. Then what this says is that I don't care what delta is, right? I can scale up my number of time steps so that I take smaller and smaller steps, basically, it turns out. And um, then I could satisfy what you want. You can stay very close to the sheet of paper if you want. As long as I'm allowed to take one over delta squared steps, we can do it, OK? And this, of course, means that um, you know, the bound of the traversal lemma really does need to scale with the number of time steps. OK, so what's the proof intuition? Again, this is totally inaccurate, but it gives you the idea, right? Suppose I want to play this game where um, you know, it, I'm not going to deviate from what's in the notes. But suppose, again, let's just do this, right? I want to go from V to W in this magical picture. 
what does it mean to um, take a step in this picture with a two local unitary, right? So restricted kind of unitary. Again, I'm totally making this up. It's just for intuition. Well, a two local unitary, uh, unitary for us is going to be captured by this idea that um, can only uh, change one coordinate. Okay, so that means that I can either move along uh, the x-axis or the y-axis in each step. I can't do both. I can't move diagonally. Okay, so I could move, let's say, like this, or I could move like this. Right? These are the two moves I'm allowed to make in each step. That's like, uh, maybe this is u1, maybe this is u2, right? That's, again, this is uh, intuition. And now the idea is, um, what do you want to do? Imagine you want to go from a v to w, right? Now, what does it mean to kind of um, stay in the span of those two? Well, in this picture, kind of the naive way you might guess what the span should look like is it should look like the line that connects these two, okay? So this is the name of the game, intuitively. I want to go from v to w in this picture. The moves I'm allowed to make are just, I can either go you know, right or left or up or down in one step by whatever distance I like. And the goal is I need to stay as close to p as possible to this green line throughout the evolution. How do you do it? So again, pause the video, think about it. The answer is now pretty simple, right? If I want to always stay as close as possible to the green line, well, what I do is I don't take big steps, I take baby steps, right? right? I take baby, baby, baby steps. The smaller the steps, the closer I stay to the line throughout the evolution, right? But the trade-off is that my number of steps, of course, has to grow. Now they're baby steps. And that's exactly um, you know, the intuition behind showing this, right? Now to show it formally, I mean, it takes a bit of work because you have to be a little bit careful. You have to kind of shuffle amplitude over from this guy to this guy. And you know, amplitude goes back and forth throughout this process. So it, it can get a little uh, messy, but that's the basic intuition. Good, so that's it. That concludes our lecture on QCMA and ground state connectivity. Again, our goal here was to ask, you know, what type of natural selection should take place for quantum proof systems, right? Do we really need that quantum proof or not? And what we saw is that um, we studied a problem, the ground state connectivity problem, which gave us an example of when classical proofs might be useful to a quantum verifier. And we proved that this problem is QCMA complete. Roughly speaking, this problem basically asked, you know, I give you two starting ground states of a local Hamiltonian, and you have to answer for me, is there some way to map one ground state to the other via local unitaries while staying in the ground space? Or is it the case that for all such evolutions, at some point you have to leave the ground space? Okay, so is there an energy barrier in that ground space? That's it. So I um, wish you guys a good week. Have fun, stay healthy, and see you next week.